All right. Well, let's let's go ahead and get started. There may be a couple more folks that uh, pop on here in the next minute. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, this is a really great opportunity, I think, to learn a little bit about um, innovating in this time, as well as thinking uh, specifically about what we can do in regards to um, telemedicine and telehealth, because this is obviously an area that um, is grown rapidly um, due to uh, COVID, but also something that's going to transform medicine and how we take care of patients and uh, being more thoughtful in how we approach this idea and coming up with some strategies of how we can be more effective in this opportunity will really help our department, help us as clinicians and providers and people in this space, but also um, think of some real cool ways that we can advance healthcare. And so the, today we're gonna hear some uh, amazing talks from folks around uh, Michigan as, as well as from uh, abroad that are giving us some input as far as things related to telemedicine. But also um, we're gonna work as a group um, and one of the goals of this is to really come up with some great ideas and strategies around some areas in telemedicine that can be moved forward and implemented over the next year that will have impact not only for us as a group, but uh, across Michigan Medicine. And this gives us an opportunity to use this venue um, as, as um, Justin thoughtfully thought about this as a way to create opportunity to leverage some of the new metrics that we're being held accountable for and partner that with some of our own uh, leadership development process. So hopefully you'll have a great chance to think through this. Um, the output will hopefully be some cool ideas in telemedicine that we can move forward and we'll work as a group and let people um, step up and take some leadership roles in this area. So um, the way the day is going to work, I'll just share my screen for one second here and uh, just give you an overview of, um, of what, uh, what the agenda is going to look like. Um, we're going to kick things off and Jeff DeGraff is going to give us a overview of, of kind of innovating in the space of telemedicine and creating opportunities um, for change. Uh, Joyce Lee, who's a professor of pediatrics is, uh, and a kind of our leader in design thinking, is going to talk about the clinical designer. Um, and then Dave Olson is going to give us some um, ideas around how to think through stakeholders, value proposition, and give an example of that. The nuts and bolts of what we're going to try to do today is this workshop. And there's um, three teams that we're going to be focusing on. Um, one is looking at pilot programs in surgical telehealth, one is looking at access and disparities in telehealth, and the other is looking at implementation of new technologies such as remote patient monitoring and the new um, MyChart Companion, how we can leverage some of those to get more telehealth done. Um, and then the, each of those teams is going to be working with some facilitators and hopefully come up with a pitch that they'll be able to present to the group. And then um, we'll have uh, Jesse DeVito and uh, Chad Elamoodle, who are um, both in leadership roles in telemedicine across UMMG, um, to kind of give some feedback to those groups and work through some implementation of how we can move that forward over the next year. Um, so it should be a real fun day. Hopefully the output's gonna be uh, meaningful to everyone and you'll all learn a lot along the way and have an opportunity to develop some leadership. Um, so I'll stop screen sharing and uh, Aaron, uh, anything from the Zoom side of things that you wanted to add? No, I think we're all set. Okay, perfect. Well, I am two minutes ahead of schedule. So um, Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you. That's two more minutes of Q&A. So uh, enjoy. Thank well, you. Good, first of all, thanks for having me here, Mark. And good morning to everyone. And I I want to say thank you for all your uh, tremendous work during this uh, during this pandemic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen here, and I'm going to walk you through the valley of uh, of difficulty, if you will, on um, when it comes to innovation. Now, give me a second here because this is always uh, chancy. I have to figure out how to load up here my um, my slides again because this. Uh, this has an annoying way if you don't pop them up at the right time of not showing up. So give me one second here. Okay, now that should be up. Let's go back to Zoom. Let's go back to Mark here. Hold on. 
All right, let's see if I can share my screen now. There we go. All right, can everybody see? All right, so let's talk about the opportunity in telemedicine, right? Hold on, let me see if I can advance this. Has anyone uh, talked to you lately about politics or religion? <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's, we're living in that age of micro-segmenting, right? Where, where people's ideologies are so strong that they can't see anything else. So I have, I have a friend that I've known for years who I think is a really tremendous person. And she started posting recently about GMOs and how they're terrible. And I made the terrible mistake of sort of posting back of saying, well, you know, uh, a third of the world would starve if we didn't have them. Uh, there's a lot of good that comes out of GMOs. And do you think that that calmed her down or do you think it inflamed her? It just made her more, it made her more uh, agitated. So uh, what you do is she, she agitates for a while and you kind of ignore her, right? That's the beginning of this whole, this whole idea. And then eventually, uh, I was doing something with my, uh, with my team at the end of Atrium, and we were out uh, having, a, we were picking berries. <clears throat> and sure enough, I get this very long dissertation about how terrible it is that the berries we're picking are all GMO. So now, just ignoring her doesn't work. So after this goes on for about three months, on a dark night, on a dark road, I unfriend her. And, you know, the Spanish Inquisition couldn't have thought of this. But that's what happens with our dominant logic. We get a point of view and it becomes so strong that it creates enormous blind spots. And this is gonna become extremely important because it's not just about religion and politics. It's about medicine. It's about everything that we do at the university. It's about what people believe we should be doing. I love this quote from Schopenhauer. Every man takes the limits of his own field of vision for the limits, for the horizon, if you will, of the world. Now, I got into this, I want to give a story, I want to tell a story that will make, that will illustrate this. I got into this a few years ago with, with, a, with an editor of Forbes magazine. There was a cover story about a guy named Jack Ma, a wonderful guy who's created this company called Alibaba. And the point of the, of the story was uh, Alibaba is working with Tencent and Baidu and all these other companies. And the point of the story was basically Alibaba is going to be to Amazon what Amazon was to Sears. So if you don't know what Alibaba is, it's, it's basically the Amazon of China. And in the entire, uh, you know, the entire Christmas season last year, uh, Amazon did about $9 billion. On November 11th, which is Friendship Day in China, uh, the, uh, Alibaba did $21 billion. So this puts in perspective how much bigger. But their point was, you know, this is the same thing. And my point to the editor was, then you obviously don't know the story of Sears, right? So let me tell you what dominant logic does to that story. Now, some of us are old enough to remember who actually started email. It was called a company called CompuServe, and I know because I worked for, I was Steve Jobs' advisor uh, when I was a very young man. And uh, when we were putting together kind of how the whole thing was going to work, uh, this is this company that kind of beat everybody to the punch, and it, was, it belonged to Sears. Anybody remember where financial services, commercial financial services started, your doctors who have a little bit of money? right? It's a company called Dean Witter. They had a baby called uh, Morgan Stanley, right? Anybody remember where commercial real estate started showing up in residential real estate? Well, it's called Wall Banker. The first card that had uh, points and uh, protection, discovery, the first integrated insurance, forget Geico, it was Allstate. Anybody remember before eBay, what eBay was called? It was called Prodigy. Now, the point is Sears got there and invented the, all these technologies way before anybody else did. They got there first. Their problem was they thought that technology alone was going to make it work. So wh what did we learn from Sears? So first of all, failure to, to, to accelerate and integrate. Guys, innovation happened in a down market because risk and reward is reversed. You are never going to get a market like this again, probably in your lifetime. What's going to happen is eventually there'll be a vaccine. There'll be a way of correcting this. But the clock is ticking. Your opportunity for telemedicine is going to shrink. You've got to pick up the pace, right? Two, unwilling to expand boundaries. Sears was unwilling to take what these different divisions did and integrate them. Sears got out of Prodigy in 1993. Anybody know who entered the market in 1993? Amazon, right? The day Sears got out, Amazon got in. Sears couldn't figure out how to integrate telemedicine into the rest of the practice. They didn't understand how to expand those boundaries as well. 
tomorrow's strategies, yesterday's culture. You can have the best whammy zammy technology in the world. You know, people tell me all the time, someday we're going to have autonomous cars. Guys, we've had autonomous cars for a decade, right? Someday we're going to be able to have cars that get, you know, 200 miles a gallon. Yeah, a decade ago. The issue is, why don't we do that? Well, because there's a cultural issue. Most of your doctors didn't come up uh, through the telemedicine, you know, channel. And most of your patients don't really want telemedicine. You have an enormous cultural problem, not a technical problem, a cultural problem. The old guard waiting out the new. Oh, watch. Right now, everybody's going to love technology because this is their only way. You're their only friend right now, right? In a down market, in a crisis, innovation isn't your best friend. It's your only friend. So right now, they're loving you. What happens when things go back to normal? All the old guard are just going to wait you out with passive aggressive behavior. Oh, I love your work. Oh, I wish I could help you. It's not in the budget this year. Remember last year we missed our target. We, we trade. The, the, the new for the now. And if you don't believe that, look at all the stuff that's coming out from, a, from a, the top of our university, right? Look at how that's preparing itself to go back to normal. Well, there isn't going to be a normal again, is there? So you have to put something in place that gives you some leverage. And finally, it takes way more than technology to innovate. Technology is just the beginning of things. You got all these other things you got to change. Now, here's the point. Every organization and every person has a tension. And the tension is to moderate or to reduce variation. That's how you make money. You become efficient, right? And that's alignment. That's also quality, if you will. But the other side of it, and this is where it's hard for doctors, right? Is you have to increase variation or diversity in order to create innovation. Innovation is a form of deviance. And the more deviant it is and valuable it is, the more, the, yeah, the more deviant it is, the more valuable, hopefully, the innovation is. Now, here's the point. In most views, this tension is negative, right? So I'm laying out this whole point for you that this is a real challenge. In innovation, it's a positive boon. And the reason is innovation is the product. It's the, it's the creative result of constructive conflict. Innovation doesn't come from everybody sort of trying to align. Innovation comes from when these two things come together and we build hybrids. We build better ways. We build third ways. And that's what I'm hoping you'll do. I love this quote from John Dewey. Some of you know I built my first innovatrium across the street from the original Dewey School for a reason. Conflict is the gadfly of thought. It stirs us to observation and memory. It instigates to invention. It shocks us out of our sheep-like passivity and gets us noting and contriving. You know, it's sort of the very American thing. You know, if you ever look at test scores, we're not the smartest people on the planet, right? But we try stuff. And we're willing to mix it up. And of course, this is one of our big challenges right now. We're at an inflection point because the history of innovation in America is the history of immigration, right? We're a country of immigrants, people with different ideas. And our diversity really is more than just a moral issue. Of course, it is a moral issue, but it's also an issue of how we've been successful. Now, most of you have probably seen this model. This is the original Quinn and Cameron model, right? The competing values framework. If you're familiar with my work, the innovation code, the innovation genome. There are these four types of, of innovation. And I'm gonna take you through them very quickly, but they're, these types push against each other. So it's not a Myers-Briggs test. I'm an ENTP or an INFJ. It's more like a football uh, playbook, where if you're running this kind of defense, I have to run this kind of offense. And this is actually used on Wall Street to predict stock prices. So there's a lot more to it than I'm gonna lay out here. But the notion is, there are four basic forces to innovation. So let me take you through the four forces. The first force is what Mark is all about. We're going to talk about the create force or the forward position. We're going to be held together by vision. We're going to be, be entering a highly ambiguous situation this morning. We're going to want uh, fluid changes because we're making it up as we go along. And we're sort of feeling our way and taking shots on goal to figure out how to make telemedicine work. My favorite, uh, I'm going to use movie this morning. Remember the Ed Harris moment in uh, Apollo 13 where he takes his uh, chief, of, chief of staff and they walk in the other room and they throw all the pieces on the table and they say, we've got one hour to put a round peg in a square hole, right? Yeah, this is what this is. And this is where these people actually really, really shine because this is kind of their, this is their thing. Well, the other side of it is this is medicine. You know, we have to make sure that we take care of patients. We can't hurt anybody, right? Or at least to the best of our ability. The aft position is the control position. It's all about process. And process is about efficiency. It's about quality. It's about data-driven. It's about getting to scale. So telemedicine is one of the big things about telemedicine is you can get to scale, but hard to do. 
hard to do with an innovation. So this handoff between the forward position and the aft position is difficult. My favorite movie about this is Moneyball. Watch Moneyball about five times. The Jonah Hill character who looks at stats and they pick the, the team for the Oakland A's based on stats, just like, just like you do doctors. You know, the URC and all the stuff you've got, all your stat run rate. Now, the point is these two forms of innovation are actually oppositional. They're not style issues. To increase quality, you have to reduce variation. To increase innovation, you have to, to increase innovation, you have to increase variation. It's not about I'm this type and you're that type. It's the outcome you're looking for. But there's a key to this, which is when we start studying this, it turns out that organizations that are able to do these two things at the same time outperform over a period of time organizations that can't. And it's less than 8% of the organizations in the top 2,000 organizations in the world that can do this, which means it's hard, right? It's easy to talk about this. It's, it's ridiculously hard to do it. And this is the issue of how much innovation do we want? So I'm going to throw this back to, to Mark and, and to, to Justin. Do we want radical innovation with a lot of risk? Or do we want incremental innovation with no risk at scale? And I think the answer is you want the best of both worlds. So when you get to the next phase of this and you start working this out, this is where it gets difficult. This is where it talks cheap. It takes money to buy whiskey, right? Well, then we also have, you know, Ross is weighing in here. Ross in the law school, you know, those, remember the old law school logo it used to have Michigan law and they had a white shark on it, right? I told you everything you needed to know. If you know anything about the Black Rock guys, they're all Michigan guys, but they're law guys. They're across the street, right? Gangsters, the whole lot of them, right? And this is the group that's the compete group. They're basically athletes and they're held together by goals. They're very goal oriented. Prospecting opportunities, rapid execution, the individual has to show ownership. These are your surgeons, right? You're, this whole surgeon culture is like this. I do a ton of work at the Pentagon. These are fighter pilots, right? These guys are whack, right? It's all about get it in, get it done, short-term vision, not a long-term vision, overcoming boundaries. I love the movie, The Big Short. And for years, some of you know, I've been an advisor to the Federal Reserve. And one of the things I love about this, and we're going through it again, is that you know, there's a lot of nonsense in the world about what's going on in terms of uh, financially. And it's just, if you believe it, if you believe it, good luck to you. But what I love in this uh, movie is the Steve Carell character. And he's abrasive and he's curt and he's right. And he cuts right to the chase and he gets rid of the BS all over the place. And it's all about, you know, buying and selling. He doesn't care whether it's aerospace or tangerines, right? The notion is he's there to accomplish the goal, which is to make money. These are the Goldman Sachs guys, et cetera. Finally, the opposite, the collaborate position, the values oriented people, right? The sages, incidentally, these are our children. These people are in the street today. These people have had enough because we violated their values. My generation, the boomer generation achieved the goals. We went to space, we licked the commies, we built the net. <laughs> Boomers, this next generation is saying, yeah, but you forgot about values and values matter. Right, so the bees are all angry and have good reason to be angry, right? So this is about community engagement and boundary spanning and, and the whole idea of sustainability. We have to train people for this. And of course, one of my favorite movies about this is Gandhi and I love the scene of, of uh, India is bread and salt, right? The whole notion is that we're, that we're really held together by our values and the way that we view the world. Now, why am I taking you through these four things? Well. First of all, there's a second tension. The second tension is about speed. You know, do you go fast or do you want to be sustainable? And the answer is you want to do both. So whatever you work on today, my key, my thing, key to this will be, can you get momentum? Can you get out of the blocks? Because if you can't get out of the blocks and this is going to take you a year to make anything go, good luck to you. Your crisis is going to go away. Your, 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 your runway is going to get shorter. But your, what you're doing today has to give you a next step to the next thing, which is sustainable, which is you're going to try and get to scale. So how much and how fast are the, are the words of the hour, if you will, for you right now and everyone else? Think about how nobody heard of Zoom. Zoom was a nothing three months ago, four months ago. Now Zoom is everything and everyone's falling over themselves to get into Zoom. So what I want you to think about is how you innovate is what you innovate. So this is like being in a a tool shed, you got a hammer, a wrench, a saw, and a screwdriver. They're all important, but they're not interchangeable, right? But you need all of them. 
And what you're gonna need in order to make this work is you're gonna have to get beyond just the forward position. You're gonna have to think how this gets institutionalized and here's how you do it. Number one, you have to assemble a diversity of perspectives. You have to know your blind spots. So I'm rebuilding all of my courses in Ross right now. And some of my colleagues are, are you know, they're, they're sharing all this stuff. You know what I've done? I've put together a cohort of MBAs, current and former MBAs, and I've asked them, right? The notion is instead of us doing this, as if we knew, why don't we go talk to some people that give us some diversity so we can look in our blind spots? People think differently than I do. They think we have different ideas. And yes, it's annoying and there's a lot of conflict, but it's constructive. And we'll build something really interesting out of it. Think of it right now. What's the university doing? They're closing ranks and they're giving us all these emails about what's gonna happen. This is the opportune time to look at the edges of campus because the very programs that are gonna take us forward are the pilot programs, are the, you know, the interdepartmental things, the experimental things, and they're the exact things that'll be cut, right? Because look at the group that's doing it, right? So if you really wanna succeed at this, you have to widen the aperture. Number two, engage in the conflict. What we learn in faculty meetings is not to actually have the discussion. Now we don't have ad hominem discussions. I don't want it to be religion and politics. That's not the point. The point is different points of view. So what I suspect is gonna to happen to you is that the people who don't want telemedicine, they don't say they don't want it. They just want things to go back the way they were and make the money that they did before. They're gonna become passive aggressive on you. Are you gonna call them out? Are you gonna have the discussion you need to have? That's what's gonna make this work or not work, right? You have to establish a shared goal and this is where it starts to come together. Think about the whole healthcare thing. I know some of you know I gave the TED talk at the White House when the Affordable Care Act was rolled out. It actually had to move to the Kennedy Center because we had so many people. And one of the things that cracked me up about it was you had one group that said, you know, we had to have health care that was entirely, you know, free market, right, and technology. The other group said, well, you know, we have to have health care that's entirely, you know, nationalized. Of course, we, COVID showed us how well that would have worked. The point of the matter is we spent almost a, a half a trillion dollars on this argument, which is ridiculous because all the answers sit in between this. We want people to be healthy, don't we? All the people. We want it to scale. We want it to be more equitable, right? We want, we want to serve the underserved. But the point is, it's what's happened is we're stuck in this dominant logic of ideology. So when you create a shared goal, that's a way of bringing people together. And as those of us who are a certain age remember that Americans know how to do that. We got to remember how to do that. And then finally, we have to construct hybrid solutions. That's what you're going to work on today. What is the solution that's more than just a piece of tech? It's going to take us forward. Now, a couple of things to remember before we get off here. First of all, innovation doesn't happen from the inside out. It's an outside in game. You know, I call this the 2080 rule. It's easier to change 20% of Michigan medicine, 80% than it is to change 80% of Michigan medicine, 20%. What you have to remember is that innovation happens when risk of trying something radical and the reward of staying where you're at is reversed, like now, right? That will change. So innovation doesn't move inside out. It moves outside in. That's why you need perimeter players. And the reason is, think about it, whether it's a fashion trend or music or a startup, it doesn't start in the middle because the middle is designed to protect itself. And that's what the university is doing right now. So where you need to understand you are, you are in the forward position. You are now making it up as you go along. You're feeling your way forward. You're trying to integrate technology. It's not gonna be perfect. It's back. In fact, it's gonna be pretty ugly. You're on version one. Think about the first draft of any paper you've ever written. It's crap, right? But version two gets better if you stick to it. In version three, if you're really willing to stick to version three, well, you're, that's, you're gonna rock on. The middling positions come next, which is about can you make money at this and can you, does it fit with your values? The middling position is often called Death Valley. It takes three times as much money as you think it will and three times as much time. That becomes the issue of are you willing to stick this out? It's tough. It's tough in the middle. Most people give up. That's why it's so hard. Then finally, are you willing to scale this thing? And the problem with scaling, of course, is they never see it coming. Because the minute telemedicine kicks in, you have destroyed the business model of Michigan medicine. The whole way in which you make money. Think about what happens after COVID-19 with the university at large. Do you think after somebody's been taking Spanish 101 online that they're gonna wanna pay to take Spanish sitting in a classroom in MLB? No way. So the notion is we've gotta give a line of sight to all four of these. Now this is called Schumpeter's Gale. 
Schumpeter is a famous economist. And Schumpeter basically said what happens to organizations is that they grow in these stages. So this is the graph on top of Schumpeter, right? Organizations start with the green position. That's what Mark and Justin and you guys are working on. But then the problem becomes you're going to try too many things and the blues are going to kick in. It's going to be about money and time. Then what's going to happen is it's going to be about are these our values? We took an oath. This is what we do. We're mission driven. I got it. And then finally, what's going to happen is you're going to get big like you are now. And you're going to be really successful. And you're going to make U.S. News and World Report top 10. And everyone's going to go, yay, we're so smart. Yeah, we're the top public university in the world. Flip everybody off. They take that, Berkeley, right? And then what's going to happen is you're going to get COVID-19. And everything that you're going to work on is going to have to go through that committee where every metric that you've got, Mark was talking about this before you started on here, every person sits on the capital committee, every person sits on the curriculum committee is designed to do what? Is designed to eliminate variation. This is what Schumpeter calls the point of creative destruction. And that's what you're going to have to overcome. You're going to have to get through the old guard, the empire striking back. But it is at this exact moment when the organizational model collapses that you have a unique opportunity that you will not get again. The whole problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves, but wiser people so full of doubts. Great innovators are optimistic, but full of doubts, prudent, right? Don't believe everything you're doing. Step, it, step by step, have a sense of destiny. Now, when you get together today, I highly advise you to think around these four types of innovation. And I'd like you to think about what doesn't work. What doesn't work right now when we have COVID? And I want you to think about what does, right? What doesn't work and what does? Because that's going to give us our shared vision. And then what I want you to think about is the decisions that need to be taken beyond what you're doing in this meeting around telemedicine. What do we need to do more of, right? And this is the big one. What do we need to stop? If you've really got an innovation, you're going to take somebody else's market away from them. You're going to stop something. Everything costs something in this world. Anybody who tells you differently is trying to sell you something, right? What are you willing to stop? Here's a radical thought. What if the whole key to telemedicine isn't starting anything? What if it's stopping some things? That's a lot harder, isn't it? And then finally, what do you need to keep doing? Because remember, you're a top flight. You're one of the best medical centers in the country. Michigan medicine rocks, you know, you don't want to throw that out. I want you to remember the DeGraff hypothesis. <laughs> the amount of innovation an organization produces is inversely related to the number of stupid PowerPoint slides, mea culpa, mea culpa, right? Or elaborate process diagrams. It makes about innovation, right? You have to do the creative work that the organization can't, right? It's not that the organization's bad. It just can't do it. It doesn't have time. It doesn't have space. And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to do the creative work the organization can. So let's take some questions. I went to 20 minutes here, a little longer than I'd hoped to, but let's get some questions. I've, I'm not seeing it in the, ch oh, here's here, chat, 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 chat. I apologize in advance. Okay, that's not. Questions for Jeff can be submitted here. Anybody want to take a shot at the old man? <laughs> no? You turn your mic on. I'll wait for a minute. And if no one has questions, we'll move on to the next the next speaker. Hey, Jeff. This is Justin. Uh, I'll, ask you, I'll, tell, I'll take a shot at the old man. Yeah. <laughs> of course, it's the other wrestler on the line here. Yeah, of course. We, we do have that. We do have that bond. <laughs> so, so my, my question is. It's kind of interesting to think about innovation, and actually, I thought a lot. I thought a lot about it this spring as we were taking our clinical operations down from 100 and you know 100 percent to five percent, and then rebuilding because the the quote, which I've heard you say many times, you know, in crisis, innovation isn't your best friend; it's your only friend. I you know I love that line, and I lived through it in a way that I never really did before because we had to. We had to be. We had to invent new processes real time, which was a lot of work, um, but it was also a creative process born of a profound crisis, right? Yep, yep. And I think so. That my question to you is: We have we we've been more creative and done more change in 
you know, in a short period of time than we, our organization ever has done before because we had to, for safety and to, take, to save lives and to protect our people, right? We had these incredibly huge motivations to do that. Um, and it, it was fascinating to watch an organization that move, has moved very incrementally and very, you know, very slowly through committees. There were no committees. People were just doing things up, down, you know, and yep. people would make a decision and everyone would go do it. It was a fascinating time to work in the organization. So my question to you is, is how do we make sure to preserve some of that moving forward, right? Obviously, yeah. you, you can already feel the committees reforming and regrouping yep. and holding us, slowing us down. I see Scott Regenbogen there <laughs> shaking his head. Yeah. As one of the health system leaders who was one of the people doing these things, you know, the, the committees, the, the cement is starting to eke back into our organization. How do you? How yeah, do you yeah, that's a great top? question. Th three things, um, three things on top of that. One, chronicle what you're doing, right? Everything that you do in an ad hoc way, you need to codify and, and turn into process. I call it simplify, systemize, and synchronize. So that experiment, which was your innovation, was an innovation in, in how you ran things. It was a management innovation. It was a process innovation. So one, don't lose how you did it. So somebody has to be sort of a scribe or looking down from the balcony, sort of saying, you know, this worked, right? And think about, if I may put this clearly, think about drug discovery. So you go from eight years and what, a billion three or whatever the number is to, you know, it's not going to take six months like they say, but let's say it's 12 or 14 months. The real question is, is anybody going to, is anybody keeping track of how that happened? right? So that it, they could do it again. And remember, it's version one. So when you go through version one, there's going to be a whole bunch of problems with the way you did it. But, but what it's going to tell you is what version two needs to be. The second thing is organizations uh, don't change from the inside out. Now, you know this better than anyone, Justin. I built my first innovatorium with my own money, and I built it across the street from the Ross School, right? Why? Because I knew that I couldn't get anybody to change unless they saw it. So what was it, 12, 15 years later, they built their design lab? I mean, you gotta laugh, right? Or think about the online stuff I did, you know, with the engineering school in like 06. So the notion is they have to see it. And the way to see it is, you remember, you're not trying to, you're not embarrassing mama, you're helping mama, right? But you're helping mama by showing mama how to do it. So in a sense, Justin, what I'm suggesting is you run a, um, almost like a second or a shadow organization, a perimeter organization. And you're great at this. I know some of the stuff you do. You're an old campaigner just like I am, right? So that's the thing. The third thing is I would really bring some people in uh, very, I would bring some people in who are perimeter people. So my big thing, for example, with the universities going on, where is the pilot program in this? Where are the interdepartmental programs in med in, in this? Where are the real experimental things they're doing in LSNA in this? Where are they in the meeting? So the issue, Justin, is not how, it's who, right? When you get the same, this is why I was saying I brought the, M the MBAs in because what I realized is I have a blind spot. I said, I'm an old guy. And even though I've invented a lot of stuff in my life, I need some other, I need some other people who think differently than I do. Right. I need to know, you know, I need to know. Yeah, I can watch television and I know why they're in the street, but I need to know why they're in the street. And that's bringing them into the center of this. Now, the final part, no one will love you. No one will give you enough money. No one will want to sustain this. And you're at a point, Justin, in your life where you've got more clout to do this than just about anybody around here. But the point is, it has to be done. Right. And if you don't do it, who's going to do it? So those are the three things I would do. And when the young people talk to me, they're always like, how did you do this? Like it was a cakewalk. I'm like, no. And then they, they think it's like a, a bar fight where you won the bar fight. It's like, no, I just learned to take a lot of punches. Right. I learned to take enough punches and to do enough good things along the way to build the things I needed to do. I think this is an inflection point. And to, to be honest with you, Justin, I'm not sure the university is getting high marks right now. I think there's a lot of the old guard trying to wait this out. And if it, if it were different, I would be seeing some different kinds of experiments and I'd be some people who looked a little differently. And I'm not seeing that. And you, you have to know, I've been in over half the Fortune 500 at this point in my life. This is the first step of old, reliable wandering off into oblivion, right? We've got to get that, those edges 
closer to our decision-making process? Very long answer to a short question, but it's a complicated question. It's hard to make something new. It's harder to sell it. It's the hardest to get the organization to do it. And that's what you've been living through. Me too. I have never been busier in my entire life than I have since COVID hit. You know, there's a lot to be done. You're everybody's only friend. I, well, you know, the good news is <laughs> it's, a, it's a sad state of affairs. I'm like, you know, I'm like the guy who cleans up after disaster, right? You know, well, it's a living, right? It's a living. So let's get some of these questions. Hope, hopefully, Justin, I got you some ideas here. And, and feel free to call me later, too, if you want to. We'll make sure we get your right side up. But I love the fact that it's energizing, isn't it? But it's also, when I came home, I went from, I'm a, like a 12-hour-a-day guy. I, I was like, I've been doing, I've been doing double shifts <laughs> the whole time here. And you think you got problems. I do a lot of work at the Pentagon. <laughs> this is a lot of fun. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have time you, for one last question from the yeah. chat room from uh, Mike Kemp. Um, yep. He says, uh, yeah, after try yeah, you want to read that, Jeff? After trying the first iteration, how do you distinguish between bad process that kills a good idea versus bad ideas at the core to determine if an idea is worth pursuing after the first iteration? Um, yeah, there's a couple things. First of all, uh, I never try one idea in one way. I take the venture capitalist road of giving a, a wide array of ideas for the same problem, very little money and very little time. I like horse races and I don't like to bet horses to win. I like to bet uh, stables to show, right? I like to see how, which one's gonna work. So that the notion is when you're doing your, um, when you're doing your review in real time, what you wanna look for, Michael, is disconfirming feedback, not confirming, disconfirming. What is it that's telling you you're off the actual target that you've got? The other thing that I got to caution you about is the biggest problem innovators have is not their solution to the problem. It's that they get the problem wrong, right? That they didn't spend enough time on what was really wrong here. So we've all worked on progs, you know, on programs that we came in, we, you know, we, we accomplished what they said to do, and it turned out that wasn't the problem at all. So I think that's key. I think the other key is, uh, Michael, absolute transparency and honesty in groups. We can learn from Bridgewater and what Ray did over Bridgewater. The notion is most of the time we get into groups, we want confirming feedback because we don't want to look like we failed. Great innovators. I could tell you, I belong to this um, group for years called the Vanguard Group. When you get together, you brag about <laughs> all the things that, that blowed up real good, you know, and you talk about the failures because you're trying to make that normative. You're trying to say innovators fail. So Ted Williams never talked about how he, you know, he wrote a book about how he got to 400, but if you ever read the book about why he was such a great hitter, he talked about all the pitchers he couldn't hit, right? That's how you take other people and you make it normative. So wider shots on goal, make failure normative. Accelerate it. Guys, again, I love what you're doing. I love what you're doing today. I'm very grateful for everything that you do. Just for the academic community here at Michigan, you're great, right? I hope, uh, I hope you're highly successful today and, uh, and good luck with everything. Mark, thanks, thanks for having me on. Thank you, Jeff, really appreciate it. All right, everyone, talk to you later. Okay, well, that was very inspiring. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Joyce Lee. Joyce, uh, I think I see you on the call, great. Joyce is going to yeah. talk. Welcome. Thanks for thanks for joining us today. Um, Joyce is going to talk a little bit about the design process and uh, clinicians as a designer. So I'll turn it over to you. Um, let's make sure you have screen sharing. Yeah. So can you guys hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Great. Okay. Sorry. I'm uh, I like flew to California, so it's like five in the morning here. <laughs> because I kind of came emergently for a family issue. So um, just, yeah, just winging it a little bit, just based on um, kind of personal issues. So um, let me see if I can share. And then um, I do want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, uh, I am not Jeff DeGrasse. <laughs> and I actually told Mark when I started, when he asked me to do this, I was like, I'm really scared of surgeons. Um, so, uh, uh, just want to uh, preface this by saying that um, 
uh, delighted to be here, but and also excited to buy the fact that you guys are kind of pursuing innovation as an enterprise. I think it's, I think it's really neat. I think you have an an, an awesome leadership team. Um, so I just wanted to share some insights uh, that I have as a clinician um, uh, who thinks a lot about uh, design thinking. So let me just see. So wait. I should be better at technology. I really should be. Okay. So Oh gosh, this shouldn't be so hard. Okay. Present. Thank you. All right. So you guys can see my screen. Yes, that, that uh, looks fine, Joyce. Okay, great. Okay. And then you guys should definitely jump in. Okay, because I want this to be as interactive. So I do have some disclosures. Um, and uh, just wanted to say that I'm uh, a clinician who has a deep interest in patient-centered design. I uh, have been spending actually a lot of time working with Epic, becoming a physician builder, getting clarity proficiency, doing Tableau, um, and then spend more time in sort of administrative roles now, uh, which relate to, I think, Epic quality improvement and operations now. Um, so I am the health IT champion for Fast Forward Medical Innovation, but in addition, sort of homegrown, have worked with a group of uh, collaborative folks across uh, campus, whether that's architecture or school of information or in design to really think about how to bring design thinking into um, healthcare. So um, just wanted to share some thoughts in this sort of short period of time that I had. Um, and the first uh, kind of message that I had is that design is a process. So it's Friday, technically at like 8.45 AM, right? And you have a 30 minute meeting. Um, can you park here and how long can you park? So would love your participation in this. Um, not sure what you think of that sign. I've actually blown it up so that you can actually see all the different component parts. Um, but please take a stab at it because you guys are surgeons and you're doers and you're super smart. Um, so uh, tell me, are you gonna get a ticket or not? And if you're befuddled, please articulate that. I would get a ticket for knocking the sign down. <laughs> yeah, so um, so there's this designer, Nikki Silientang. So she's a uh, designer who's based in LA, New York, and she um, she had this problem, right, where she was getting parking tickets all the time because she would try to park, uh, she would try to interpret the sign, but um, it would always result in this sort of negative outcome for her as an individual. So she had a problem. And, you know, I think the tendency in general when things don't go well for individuals is that we tend to blame ourselves, right? She says, I, but I read the sign and I thought I could park there. Did I misunderstand something? I wonder why the signs had to be so complicated. My mind felt like it was doing intense math whenever I tried translating the signs. Um, so she actually just went through the design process. And um, I think this is something that we do all the time, right? It's just that we haven't articulated it that way, right? Um, she first just said, okay, what's the problem here? Um, she decided that it was worth kind of looking into and focusing on. Um, so she started kind of picking apart the sign. She actually was applying for uh, graduate school at SVA um, in New York City. Um, and so she, she needed to have a portfolio project anyway. So this was sort of the, the portfolio that project that she started with when she was kind of on, on her initial kind of design professional journey. Um, and so then what she started to do is say, hey, you know what, I think there's issues with this design. I actually want to do some ideation, right? I want to, um, you know, design it so it actually makes more sense. So she started with some pencil sketches on a piece of paper, right? You know, circles, bars, who knows what, right? Calendars. Um, and then she actually came up with a prototype, right? And um, people will talk about how prototype is worth uh, uh, is, is worth much more than any sort of idea you could ever have in your head, than any sort of, um, you know, any sort of something that you could document in Microsoft Word, right? She created a visual structure um, that people could react to um, to see if this could be a more effective solution to communicating uh, whether people could park or not. Um, so she ended up doing some testing in New York City. So she, she took her little design she actually laminated it. Um, she put it on, uh, she took a sign in New York City, uh, interpreted it correctly using her design, put it up against the, against the, um, the, the pole, and then, you know, asked this question with the box, right? And so this is easier to understand. And so she had a little Sharpie, and it's really cute because someone wrote back to her and said, this is awesome. The mayor should hire you. I love this. Um, 
And so um, she went through a couple more iterations, right? She thought about people who are colorblind. Um, she has like red and green. She added some, some bars or hashes. And um, I would say she had a huge design success. So she actually got a lot of, um, she, she open sourced the design in fact. And then, so there were actually a lot of cities that decided to kind of adopt the design and actually use it as they were doing their urban planning. So they used that design and created sort of prototype signs that they could put up in their, um, in their cities. And she got a lot of press for this, but I think the most interesting thing is that there were a lot of positive outcomes in like New Haven and in Sydney and some other cities, right? There was up to 60, up to 60% improved compliance with regard to people being able to actually um, uh, understand whether they could park at the time they needed to park, right? So we talk a lot about health outcomes, but, you know, definitely design resulted in improved parking outcomes for the user. Um, so, you know, to me, design is just a form of problem solving, right? Can the user accomplish their goal without hindrance, hesitation, or questions? And, you know, human-centered design or design thinking, this is sort of, you know, Don Norman is the, the father of design thinking. Um, uh, this is his definition, an approach that puts human needs, capabilities, and behavior first, then designs to accommodate those needs, capabilities, and ways of behaving. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that you you have other speakers today who can speak more to the commercial aspects of this, but I think this is just the essence of, um, you know, not just what we should do as innovators or as, um, you know, individuals trying to create new businesses, right? I think this is also um, just, I think, an ethos that we need to adopt as clinicians that are inside a delivery system because we design experiences every day in our roles as clinicians, as as educators, as researchers, as you know, people trying to create a new system of healthcare, uh, given the disruption that we've just had related to COVID. Um, and so I think what is really interesting about this story and why I love this story is that uh, Michael Beirut is a really famous designer from Pentagram and he actually designed the logo for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign last round, right? And he actually got hired by New York City to redesign the parking signs because of sort of the lack of clarity. Um, and so his design, you can see it on the left, it's, it's, it's okay, like he got paid to do this. Um, and he's a really like highfalutin designer. But I think what's fascinating to me is that Nikki came up with a much better design. Um, and she was just a graduate school applicant who had yet to even enter her kind of professional training in design. So um, I guess one of the messages I have for all of you is that um, you are all designers, right? And, and um, want to sort of empower you to think about what are pieces of the system that you can and should fix. Um, so the second lesson I have is around design being a mindset. Um, and I think you would agree that there are a lot of parallels between parking signs and healthcare, right? And so um, I want you guys to look at this mobile view. This is on an Android. And this is actually a, a result, a test result for a patient who had HPV genotyping. Um, and I'd like you to tell me if you think that the results are uh, normal or abnormal. Someone has to say something. Mark, you have to respond. It, it looks like uh, it's, it's the an patient has type result. 16. The test is normal, but the, res uh, the test is abnormal, meaning it's positive, but the test was done normally. Yeah, but when I saw this, when I saw this, I was like, it's normal, right? So this is what it looks like on mobile, and this is what it looks like on um, on actual Epic, right? And so Greta uh, Greta showed me this, and I was like flabbergasted um, because you know if you're a, if you're a clinician, you're like between patients, you're running to cases, you peek at your mobile phone, right? And, you know, you take a quick glance and you're like, oh, normal, right? And so you guys took the time today, right? Because I asked you to, to look at this and verify, but I could imagine that someone might see this, they might say, oh, test results are normal. Hey, have the nurse call the patient and let them know, right? Um, so, you know, I think this is a clear example of, um, where we have a lot of improvement to make uh, with regard to our, you know, design of our systems and 
Uh, I think this is a big one because uh, this really could affect sort of the, the, you know, the outcome for the patient. Uh, what about this one? So apparently this is the sepsis screening tool. This is the output from a sepsis screening tool. Yeah, and I don't know. I I I uh, <laughs> this is, I don't even know what I don't even know what the purpose of this notification is, right? Um, it's not necessarily something that's internal to us, but I think what I'm just trying to make the point is like, what is the information you're trying to communicate? Uh, what is the user supposed to do with it, and how can you design it to actually make it useful and and usable? All right. Um, so you guys are on the topic of telemedicine. We've all been doing like a ton of telemedicine. I was actually in a uh, video visit clinic a couple of weeks ago, right? And I'm doing all my video visits for diabetes and the mother, I call her 10 minutes into a call and, you know, I say, you know what, uh, why aren't you joining the visit? And she said, well, I keep getting these dermatology questionnaires and we've never seen dermatology. So she didn't want to fill them out because she didn't want to proceed with giving kind of false information. So I reverted to a phone visit, but I did follow up with the HITS people and, um, I think this is so interesting. I don't know if you guys have ever done a video visit for yourselves on the patient side, but this is actually what the portal looks like uh, when you are uh, when you are a consumer, right? Using my chart. So if you're going to a video visit, uh, which button do you think you would go to? Do? E e visit appointment. Yeah. Yep. Right. But. It turns out e-visit is that new kind of like asynchronous communication, which is that type of visit where you put an email in through the portal, then they email you back through the portal, right? It actually has, like, if you want to go to a video visit, you actually have to go to appointments. Um, so it was interesting. I got this message back from the, from the HITS people, like, by looking at the audit trail, it must have been that mom got confused by the e-visits. Uh, tried to going to that and then and, uh, and, and instead of going to the appointments menu, right? And so I thought it was fascinating because they literally wrote in the email. So the root cause here is patient error, right? Um, and like I, you know, as a consumer, like I would have gone to the first one too. That's what I would have gone to, right? Intuitively, uh, that's what the design, you know, is telling me what to do, right? And so um, you know, I think one of the messages I just want to have in general is that we need to stop blaming patients, right? It's clearly bad healthcare system design uh, rather than the patient's fault uh, causing some of these problems. And I, and I, uh, I recognize that, you know, going to the wrong button on a video visit is really not that big a deal, but I think there's a lot of other scenarios or cases in which um, there will be mishaps, there will be problems, there will be ser serious safety events, right? But we really have to think about design instead of thinking about how individual how individual actors can be blamed or not blamed for their actions, um, and so I think what's really interesting about this example is that uh, we're actually doing the workaround here internally, right? So apparently they added some screen out questions to the e visit questions, asking a patient if they're scheduled for a video visit or not. So if they're scheduled for a video visit, it's going to end the e visit, and I thought that was kind of interesting because I feel like I would have rather just used like more clarity of wording to just lead them to the right place and they have to create that whole separate workflow, but it, that was something that they had done. And then the other thing they did was they created a sign. Um, and so what I refer to as a sign in this case is, you know, adding verbiage to the patient reminders for video visit, reminding them that they need to click on the appointments icon. Um, and so uh, I don't know if you guys ever follow, uh, well, actually, uh, you're, you guys are brilliant because you're, you're the surgeons. So tell me, Tell me about these doors. Tell me what you think of these doors. The signs are wrong. Sorry. You should be pulling and pushing. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I like, I'm getting blitzed by my sister's sprinkler right now. So <laughs> I'm just going to go on the uh, porch with the thing. Yeah, so, um, so, right, like, there's a handle, but then it tells you to push, right? And then you expect to push on the on the um, on the left hand side. You expect to push on the door, right? But it says pull. So do you guys know what type of door this is? There's actually a term for it. Dumb. Wait, what did you say? Dumb. Oh. <laughs> 
so it's called the Norman door, right? So Don Norman, again, who's like the father of human-centered design, right? Spent a lot of time at Apple, wrote that book, right? Um, and it's essentially uh, this notion that like, you know, uh, the door, like the design of the door implies that you should be pulling, yet they have, there's a sign that says push, right? And the design and, and, and vice versa for the other door. So it's this idea that you should be, um, these doors are counterintuitive and they could be better designed. And, and the idea is that you shouldn't need a sign to know how to open the door, right? Um, and so there's this, uh, 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 sorry, I keep getting wet. <laughs> Apologize. <laughs> I'm going to move down the street here. Um, uh, so there's this, uh, 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 yeah, so I don't know. So signs, so like I, I'm obsessed about signs because I think signs are so interesting, right? But uh, I don't know if you've ever seen these uh, signs outside of, uh, uh, I think it's like uh, Med Sci as you're walking towards the hospital, right? Uh, but generally the idea is if it needs a sign, it's probably bad design. If you've ever been to Mott, for example, um, there are a ton of placards, right, to open these automatic doors, but no one can ever tell which placard goes to what door, and they're often positioned in ways that you wouldn't expect them to open the particular door that they're next to. So there's these signs everywhere to show people how to how to open them. Um, but I think, you know, signs are kind of a, an interesting uh, phenomenon because what they teach us is much deeper or more serious about the problematic design of our health right? Like the fact that there's this cart, right, that says bedside financial counseling tells us a lot about like the deeper systemic problems inside our system uh, that are affecting our patients like financial toxicity. And um, so I think, you know, something to think about is you're, you know, um, as you walk around the hospital or as you witness what happens inside healthcare is that I think, I do think, you know, signs signify a lack of respect for the user, right? This is actually something that's in our pediatrician's office right and it says uh, please allow five to seven business days for forms to be completed right and so what they've done is they've printed they've laminated they've put up on the wall the fact that they're actually not going to give us great or personalized customer service um, and they've been very declarative about that right um, so or I don't know if you've seen this example I think this is an interesting one um, uh, I think this came up a couple of years ago. I got this from our U, our U of M communications, right? But this is the pagers, right? Um, uh, there was issues with uh, wearing multiple pagers and phones and it was jumbling the, the um, I guess, the signals. Um, so instead of fixing the problem, they told us to separate the, uh, separate the pagers and phones by like a, a one hand width apart across our belts, which I thought was interesting, right? So put up a sign instead of fixing the problem for the user. And then I don't know if you've ever seen EpiPens, but I am the mother of a couple of kids who have food allergies, right? So we carry around these a lot. And um, there's a, uh, it's called an EpiPen, right? The design of an EpiPen. Um, there's a cap, right? And where do you think the needle would be located uh, given that it's a pen or it's the metaphor of a pen? Under the cap. Right. But do you know where the needle is located in an EpiPen? It's actually located here, right? And so what happens is that people use these uh, injectors. There are a ton of physicians who actually auto-inject themselves or caregivers who auto-inject themselves because they take the cap off the, the blue part. They put their or their thumb on the red, on the orange part, um, and they... Um, they self-inject instead of giving the injection to the actual person who needs the injection. Um, but what's so interesting is that they put a sign on the end, right? Um, which I think is fascinating because, um, you know, there are kind of other tools like LVQ or other EpiPens that exist now that actually are more intuitive, more intuitive and better designed. But, you know, the choice that these manufacturers made was to add a sign when people kept having um, issues with the counterintuitive design. So, um, and then finally, I just wanted to say that um, it's clear that design is essential in a pandemic. And I think this is something that we've all witnessed as, um, as COVID-19 has unfolded over time. Um, and I think I've been kind of watching um, 
and fascinated by all the innovation that's happening inside the health. Looks like her video might have just cut out. <laughs> Yeah, she's lost phone signal. Yeah. Okay, I'll give her a minute to come back on. Um, it, while, while Joyce is coming back on, if anyone wants to put, we have about five or six minutes of um, chat. Oh, there she is. Hey, Joyce. Hey, sorry. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, that's so weird. I just got totally, okay. Um... So we have Can you still five... see my screen? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'm almost done. All right. So, I mean, I think what's interesting is it's just been interesting to see the ways in which people have uh, designed themselves to solve particular problems, right? So the whole issue of exposure or re reducing exposure inside uh, patient rooms with COVID-19, right? Um, nurses coming up with solutions like IV pumps with long extension tubing so they can manage the drips without having to put on PPE. This is um, something that came out of a, um, a clinician from, uh, from uh, NYU, right? Where uh, the, the uh, nurses actually started writing um, just what were the most essential pieces of information that were critical for management just on the window or the door, right? So it's actually just the oxygenation, the oxygenation support that each of the individuals needed at, very, at various um, time points. Oh my gosh. Are you, ah, my computer just died. I can hear you. <laughs> That's so weird. Oh my gosh, I am so sorry. Yeah, my computer just died. Okay. Um, well, hold on one second. How much more time? Yeah, we can maybe use this five minutes for some Q&A, Joyce, so people can maybe ask yeah, some questions. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, anybody have any questions for Joyce? Chindu. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so that was a great talk, and I think that particularly as you're a little muted. Uh, Let me say close to my computer. Sorry. Um, is that better? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a little better. Okay. As we're focusing on telehealth, um, and you're showing me, you know, signs and explanations for things that are inventive that are not obvious to the research, what advice can you give us to share with our groups as we work today to make it so the solutions that we come up come up with are obvious? So we don't have to come up with complex explanations and process diagrams for patients from the very beginning. What are the important steps to follow so we don't end up with something with you know six signs pointing with different arrows to the right way to hit the right button? So in case in yeah. case people couldn't hear that, Chindu's asking, what advice do you have that when we are coming up with solutions for telehealth that the uh, signage or messaging or our ability to um, get the message across is is done in a way that patients can use it more effectively, and we're making something that's um, that's going to be easily to, easier to use. Yeah, so I mean, I think the most obvious and simple question that you guys know the answer to is that you have to talk to patients, right? And I think, um, you know, I think a lot of things happen um, in the course of very busy health systems with very with very um, diverse groups of individuals, administrators, techs, MAs, uh, you know, clinicians, uh, health IT people, right? But I think, you know, one of the, I guess one of the key messages I have is, is obviously that you should actually talk to the people at the front lines and you should really understand what that consumer experience is like. And so, you know, to the extent that we have more inclusion of uh, patients, patient representatives, um, I guess patients as partners in the co-design of the systems, then I do think the more uh, successful we will be as, as a health system so that we don't roll out, figure out that it was sort of a botched solution and then have to, um, you know, rejigger the process later on. So I would say that, you know, fundamentally. And I think, you know, there's just elements of, um, you know, different types of design research that you can do to, you know, just to sort of see what the, what the process is uh, for the patient, you know, for the sort of the patient facing experience. But, you know, I think you can also learn from 
you know, from like the tickets coming in, right? If everyone's reporting a ton of issues or a ton of confusion about a particular thing, I think that's an opportunity also, if, you're, if we're already up and running to think about where, where there are mishaps and where we can smooth over the processes. And I think that the analytics and metrics can obviously help a lot with um, providing some insight, but I do think that there needs to be a mixed methods approach to all of this such that, you know, we can have presumption about why something failed, but until you actually go and talk to individuals involved in that interaction, um, you, you have to, you're not sure if you're really going to have the answer because sometimes um, hypotheses get generated um, when you actually go to the front lines. Any other questions for Joyce? Yeah, um, I thought the what you said about the workarounds was so fascinating. Um, and I think that a lot of times when we're just really busy and like in a rush to solve a problem, it's really easy to come up with just workarounds instead of actually solving the problem. Like this whole idea of like separating the pagers instead of like streamlining it so that they all go to one pager or something. How do we prevent that from happening um, during like a crisis like COVID? Well, I mean, I think to a certain extent that there's, you know, what I love about this, because I'm a person who does quality, right? So what I love about COVID, I mean, not that there's much to love about COVID, but I do kind of appreciate the fact that the whole system has been upended and that we all have to be more experimental about the way we pursue things. And I do think that, um, you know, whether you're like a quality improvement person or you're a design person, I think there's a lot of opportunity to think about iterative design and like just, you know, um, using metrics to assess progress, uh, understanding where there are problems, and just reassessing and reinventing the process each time, right? And so that's just, you know, that's something that's part of, you know, Six Sigma, that's something that's part of, you know, if you use the, the model for improvement. But I just, I, I think that as, as, a, as a system, um, maybe referring back to what, you know, Jeff was talking about, we tend to be just like fixed, right? We say, oh, well, that's the policy, this was decided, this is like what was emailed out to, you know, 20,000 employees in the health system, right? Um, you know, to the extent that we can be more flexible as a system to identify areas of bar barriers or opportunities and to adjust the, you know, the process accordingly, I think is the most important thing. Like how, in, how nimble are we as an organization? How nimble are you as a division or a department? Like how do we provide more opportunity for communication and more opportunity for iterative design so that we don't have to get stuck with dealing with the workaround. You know, one thing that I've learned from your talks in the past is, I wrote it down to see if I say it right, is don't conform the, to the consumer to the solution, but the solution to the consumer. So don't make um, the patients fit into something we have, make something we have fit the patients. And that's something that I found really valuable that you shared in the past. And one of the other things I was gonna ask you is, you know, kind of in earlier, when we were doing graphical user design interface, there's always the idea as few clicks as possible, no more than three, with no explanation. Do you think that's attainable in this current state with what we have? Wait, so can you say what that last statement was? Yeah, so one of the things like in the 90s and stuff when I used to work on graphical user interfaces was try to get it done in no more than three clicks with no explanation required. Is that attainable in our current state? Um, I don't know that that's attainable, but I do think there's ways we can streamline it. And I do have to say that, you know, everyone, and I mean, I, like, as someone who uses Epic, I think there's so many painful pieces of it, like, where do we begin? But I also think that there are so many ways to optimize it. And what was chosen for us when we went to upgrade is not what we actually could be um, at with regard to the system as it is, because there's a lot of ways to improve, optimize, configure the system and make it better for users. And so that's personally why I decided to spend a lot more time doing health IT kind of redesign uh, to support learning health systems in particular and structured data collection and reduce physician workflow because I think there's great opportunity since it's the tool that we all use, we've all adopted and we're all stuck with. So I don't know if we can get to the three clicks, but I definitely think that we could get to better designed IT systems that would help us um, do our jobs more efficiently, give us more data where we need it, um, and reduce the, reduce the burden of hitting us two all the time. <laughs> all right. Well, Joyce, we, we're, we're on a, thank you so much for, for uh, your, your 
your thoughts and everything. Sorry, I like I had terrible um, uh, technical difficulties, and I'll send you guys the slides through Twitter, okay? Perfect. <laughs> so you can see the rest of them later. Okay, you guys take care. All right, thanks again. Um, our next thanks speaker. For me. Thanks, Joyce. Our next speaker is uh, Dave Olson, who's uh, um, one of our entrepreneurs in residence here at uh, U of M, and he's going to talk a little bit about um, stakeholders and creating a value proposition. So David, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, uh, let's see if I can get this. You should be able to see my PowerPoint at this point. Can you see that, Mark? Yep. Okay, good. All right, everybody. Um, so uh, thank you for inviting me to talk today. Um, uh, I, I agree with the earlier comment that uh, surgery has um, a standout leadership in, in innovation. I enjoy working with the surgery department on uh, these kinds of uh, projects. So uh, just quickly about, for those who don't know me, I'm a scientist by training. I left academia mostly. Uh, co-founded my first company in San Francisco. I've been co-founding companies for 23 years in the biotech space. I'm working on my seventh one right now. Um, uh, written a lot of business plans, raised money. Uh, currently, as mentioned, I'm a mentor in residence in the tech transfer office. I also uh, work in programs in the surgery department and in uh, CBC, uh, in addition to um, um, being a CEO of a startup. So what I'm going to talk about today uh, is the more commercialization leaning side of things. But um, the core of what I want to tell you is uh, I, I found in the previous two speakers. Um, so. Uh, innovation starts with an idea, uh, but the idea, of course, is just the beginning and, and uh, what you do next uh, matters. So uh, innovation, from my perspective, innovation is about change. So you have a good idea and you think that it should be supported. Uh, we need to make change. So we have to go from the status quo of people doing whatever they did before your good idea to sharing your vision. And, and likewise, we need to get sponsors who are perhaps not committed or never heard of your idea to uh, funding it or supporting it so that it can happen. Uh, and the way we make the case for change and the way I communicate it is value proposition. Uh, value proposition is a term you've un undoubtedly heard before. Uh, there are several different ways of going about describing what value proposition means and how it's used. They're all good. I'm, I'm gonna show you what uh, the one that I use uh, that I find very instructive for early stage innovation, uh, and particularly in most cases, things that I'm looking at for commercialization. So value proposition in my mind is uh, just the rationale for the innovation. Why should people change? Okay, so it's the answer to that question. And I uh, say the value proposition, in my view, can be written as a simple statement. And the statement starts that customers have a problem. This is the most important thing. There are people who have a problem. That's what you want to fix. You have a solution that's better than the alternatives available, and that using the solution would result in compelling value. So this is the value proposition statement. It is a testable statement, uh, and that's getting back to the how do we make sure that we're doing this right? Well, you have to uh, get out and talk to your customers and test it. One I'm testing, and I'm very interested in four pillars of the value proposition, the core elements, and that is who are the customers or the stakeholders, as we'll talk a little bit about. Um, what's their problem? You heard earlier that sometimes the, uh, um, the, we end up with things that don't work, not because the solution didn't work, but because we had the wrong problem. That's, that is a big deal that I run into a lot. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then of course, uh, what's the solution and what is the value? So briefly, uh, customer here is a term uh, uh, of art. It actually encompasses perhaps many stakeholders. Um, the traditional customer, that is to say, who pays for something, as well as other uh, important stakeholders that are making or affected by the decision to use or not use an innovation. The problem is the outcome or situation you seek to change. Uh, sometimes it's framed as an opportunity. Sometimes people don't think things are broken. They can just get better. That's not viewed as a problem. The solution, of course, is just the innovation that you have to address that. 
And then the value is a combination of the magnitude of the benefit of making a change or adopting the solution. And it's why that change is compelling. Um, so uh, it has to be uh, a big enough change and it has to be a big enough change over the alternatives to be compelling. So I'm gonna do a little case study here on a medical device. Some of you might have seen this uh, case study before. Um, very briefly, we're gonna talk about a medical device uh, used in diabetes. So uh, the super fast history lesson, right? Type one diabetes is an incurable killer of children historically. Uh, with no way to replace insulin, starvation was the best, most effective management plan. Uh, that changed in 1921 when Banting and Best discovered how to use an extract of the pancreas to, um, to treat patients. They started treating patients a few months later and they won the Nobel Prize in the next year. That's a pretty good uh, 18 months. Uh, Genentech discovered how to uh, then significantly improve that. Um, we went basically 60 years before we had the substantial improvement of going and uh, moving to uh, recombinant insulin, uh, which was cleaner uh, and uh, uh, could be engineered. And today there's uh, probably about 10 million uh, patients on insulin therapy in the US. And of course, most of them now are type two. So uh, the medical advice we're gonna talk about here is how we deliver insulin. Uh, insulin has to be injected subcutaneously uh, and um, hyperdermic syringes are the way it's delivered and those syringes have gotten better over time. Uh, but the, there's a view that the, uh, the next big thing here is to get rid of needles and figure out how we can deliver insulin without having to do an injection. Uh, there were some scientists at UC San Diego who had theorized that you could get the protein into the body. You can't get it through the skin. You can't eat it. Um, we haven't been successful in delivering insulin that way. So perhaps we could get insulin by inhaling it. So this team at UC San Diego figured out that if you could get uh, a powdered form of insulin deep into the lungs, uh, so you're close to the capillary beds, you could get th that protein would migrate into the blood. Patents were filed on the concept that company was formed. So this goes back all the way to 1990 at this point. Uh, the company was later renamed Nectar uh, and is, is on the NASDAQ uh, uh, starting in 1994. So let's look at their value proposition. And that's, we're gonna sort of critique this as we go along. So customers have a problem in the solution and uh, it produces compelling value. So who are their customers here? Their customers, as they are uh, looking at developing this, are diabetics. The problem is that they have to use needles every day. The solution that they're proposing is that inhalation is easier and more convenient, and that results in no needles and better health and quality of life. So that's the value proposition for development of this new medical device. And as I mentioned, customers really include multiple stakeholders. So who are the stakeholders here? And for Every project that we're gonna be working on, we're going to have to map out who the stakeholders are. Um, this is one way of uh, putting this together. We have, so we have the diabetic, but, and the diabetic uses and co-pays for the, uh, the medical device or for their, their medication. Uh, and they get their medication either from their primary care or a specialist or both, who are going to both recommend that they change the way they do things and then prescribe the new product. The payer is going to be paying for it. Um, the FDA, of course, is going to be regulating any such product. Uh, a number of folks will be influencing uh, the diabetic and also uh, the healthcare system uh, as to whether or not they should change or keep doing, uh, using what they're uh, using. And then there's other, uh, there's pharma companies and medical device companies who are either going to be promoting this idea or trying to compete with the idea. So these aren't all the stakeholders that we could have in here, but for this particular project, these are the major stakeholders we're gonna be looking at. Um, and as for the transactional customer, the sort of, if you go to buy something in a store, you go up to the cash register, you're gonna pay for it, you're the transactional customer. In this case, it's a combination of the patient and the payer are paying for it. Now, stakeholders vary in motivation and influence, and for any new innovation, the reason we map out who the stakeholders are is because it's important to understand that. So what's the uh, motivation that for uh, all the players here? Well, for the diabetic, according to the value proposition, the motivation is we can go needle-free and it's easy to use. Uh, for 
the uh, healthcare providers, we're looking at better health and better compliance in our patients. For the payer, better compliance leading to better outcomes. Uh, the FDA is interested in it because it's safe. And uh, you're driven by seeing a better quality of life uh, for an individual or a population at, uh, at large. And uh, for the pharma company or medical device company that is looking at this technology in its raw form, they're probably interested in it uh, for the competitive advantage that they could achieve from it. And in fact, that's the story we have here. So Pfizer is searching for new markets in the mid-1990s, and uh, they were looking at, um, uh, there's a lot of type 2 diabetics. Many of them are going to end up on insulin therapy, and there's an aversion to starting insulin therapy. And uh, this would be, is considered to be a great opportunity. If we could provide a product that reduces that aversion to starting insulin therapy, we would, um, if we're Pfizer, we'd be in a great spot. So they were nervous about some of the technical risk. Uh, could you scale the manufacture of these very small in, inhalable, uh, inhalable uh, insulin particles? And uh, could you build a user-friendly inhal in inhalation device? And uh, the answer is yes. So this is actually the product that was built by Nectar. Uh, it's a, a nifty piece of um, industrial design. It, it's the you look in here at the collapsed form. Um, there's also have the insulin in them. So you use either the green or the blue, depending on how much you need. You put it into the little slot. Uh, it puffs up. Uh, uh, the, the, there's a handle that comes out. It's fairly easy to teach somebody how to use this device. Uh, then the uh, powdered insulin uh, is uh, suspended in the inhalation chamber, and the uh, patients inhale it. So uh, with the, getting over these technical hurdles, uh, partnership is consummated. Pfizer says, yep, we're in on this, and they are going to create a new product. Uh, the new product is called Exubra. Uh, and for those who know about Exubra, great. If you don't know about Exubra, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So uh, to get Exubra onto the market, there was a lot of uh, additional development, clinical testing, uh, et cetera, that had to go on. There was one little hurdle. Um, the uh, FDA looked at it and had some concerns about the fact that there's a transient, uh, not permanent, but transient impairment of lung function. You know, insulin is a very powerful hormone. Um, it's not expected in the lungs at high concentrations. That's what you're doing in order to make this work. Uh, it turns out the cells were a little unhappy with that. Um, most people don't notice a 10% reduction, reduction of lung function, especially if it's uh, uh, a transient. Um, so Pfizer couldn't figure out how to make that go away. So instead, they navigated that with a comprehensive risk management plan. We see that in a lot of drugs. Um, and the FDA conceded. And on the label, it says, caution, don't use by smokers and asthmatics or anybody else who has an inherent lung function problem. And also recommended regular lung exams. These kinds of labels end up on boxes. You know, get a blood test to make sure your kidney or liver function is, uh, is, is correct, that sort of thing. So. Uh, the drug was, uh, or the new combination drug and device is approved. And here's a little uh, summary of the timeline. 1996, they signed the partner, partnership with Nectar. Uh, they got it to the FDA. In January of 2006, it was approved. So that's uh, basically a decade. Um, later that year, sales actually launched. So that was a total from the very beginning of when Nectar started working on it, 14 years and about a billion dollars. Um, that's not out of the range of development of new uh, drugs uh, in particular. Um, Pfizer was very excited about this. Their current estimate at, at the time was that they would have a, a billion dollars of sales, but they thought that that was going to be a conservative. Um, and the uh, esteemed medical journal, the Wall Street Journal, uh, for some reason, uh, got involved and named Exubra the leading innovation in biotech in medicine in 2006. So, what happened next? Uh, it, uh, it was a total disaster. And the reason I'm giving this case study is because you in fact learn a lot more about, um, as our earlier speakers have talked about, by looking at things that didn't work, gives you a lot more insight on the sorts of things you need to do in order to make them work. Um, so let's look at why this was a total train wreck, okay? Um, and by train wreck, I mean that 
uh, the next year, right? September, it's launched. October, it's, uh, it's canceled. They only managed to get $12 million of sales in the first three quarters of 07. And they had to do a write-off. And this write-off was $2.8 billion of effort had gone into getting this product, and it was a total failure. But shockingly, there was over $600 million worth of inventory that had been produced in anticipation of the tremendous demand for this product, which never materialized. And that, that inventory mostly had to go to an incinerator and literally go up in smoke. So uh, this is considered one, still is considered one of the most stunning failures in the pharma industry. So uh, what went wrong? That's, our, uh, that's what we want to look at here, okay? So what went wrong? Well, we know that pharma can't sell it because they, stopped, they gave up and uh, canceled the product. And we also have a piece of information that said the FDA approved it, but they were cautious about approving it, okay? We know that diabetics aren't using it. Uh, physicians aren't prescribing it, payers were not paying for it, and I'll talk about that, and there just wasn't a general sense of support for it. So how did that happen? There's, uh, five, it, there's at least five failure points. These are the five failure points that I find most instructive when I think about this case study, and I'm going to go through each one of these five. Okay, so um, the, the, there was an overconfidence about the market demand. And this takes a couple of different uh, pieces. One of the most important things here was misunderstanding what the problem is, right? <clears throat> in fact, this medical device works. It does deliver insulin, and it has some advantages. And yet, it was a total failure on the market. So it was not the technology failed. It was a failure of understanding the value proposition and matching the solution to the problem. So the problem that was identified that Pfizer was excited about was that Patients were uh, resistant to um, starting insulin therapy. And the assumption was because they didn't want to have to start injecting themselves with insulin. And patients don't want to inject themselves with insulin. However, if you talk to patients uh, in, in the field, many, many will tell you that, in fact, it's the glucose testing that comes along with being a diabetic that is much more difficult than the insulin injecting. And that's because glucose testing happens on the tips of our fingers. It's painful. And it has to be done many more times than, in fact, the injecting of the insulin, which occurs usually in some uh, low nerve uh, area of the body, um, uh, sort of a fatty section of the body. And eliminating injection, therefore, was not sufficient to change the aversion to the starting the insulin therapy. And in fact, many, <clears throat> many patients were, uh, their issue was primarily they didn't, they were adverse to accepting the fact that there were diabetics who needed to be treated. And they didn't want to start insulin therapy because of what that sort of uh, broke that facade. Um, they preferred not to have that happen. Uh, it was a kind of a head in the sand sort of approach. Uh, and having, uh, getting rid of the injection of insulin didn't really change that psychological problem, right? So many feared the idea of having diabetes, uh, and it wasn't the insulin therapy per se that they were uh, uh, fearing, right? So uh, making it work. Um, this is a common problem that we have with uh, when we're engineering uh, a solution. Uh, we have a value proposition. We have a draft version of a solution to that. It's not quite perfect, so we keep working on it. And what happens is uh, the metaphor down here at the bottom, the visual metaphor is the circle is the value proposition in our first draft. All of these technical specifications of that draft work. They're inside the description of the value proposition. But over time, we get glitches and we have to fix them. So here's how this worked uh, here. Good delivery required very small particles in order to get them deep into the lungs. And very small particles showed fast clearance, which meant that was good for safety. The lungs worked better when the insulin didn't hang around for a long time. The problem is that fast clearance also means you have a quick on and quick off dosing. And that's really good for delivery at meals where you want a a bolus of insulin in a hurry, um, but it does nothing for baseline support. And many of the patients need baseline support and therefore have to inject themselves with insulin to get the baseline support. And in the end, we're not getting rid of needles. The whole value proposition here was to get rid of needles, but we're not getting rid of needles because we have the, uh, the need for baseline, okay? So somewhere along the line, 
this didn't get picked up. The value that the, the fact that we did not have a needle free world occurring didn't uh, get picked up and we were driving this product development forward nonetheless. The engineers produced a product that did uh, work. It's just, it no longer was inside this dream of needle free life. Uh, here is another one, uh, kind of a funny one, probably not the biggest driver, but um, you know, most people don't, uh, it, most diabetics aren't injecting um, insulin in public. Uh, and uh, this was, this product was actually designed to be used uh, wherever, whenever. Um, and people thought it was kind of funny looking. Uh, there was actually a TV commercial uh, that, um, that Pfizer put together. It showed somebody at, I think, Denny's. Uh, and he's probably ordered a Grand Slam. And so he knows he needs to get some insulin. So he's taking a hit off of his insulin bong because that's actually what they created was an insulin bomb. And uh, the, specifically the, the background, you can see that person, no one in this restaurant notices that someone has just pulled out a bong and is taking a hit. Now, maybe that's true these days um, with legalization of some things, but uh, that was the, uh, the attempt uh, to make that work. So the uh, second big thing here was underestimating the safety concerns. It wasn't actually the safety problem. So, Transient inhibition of lung function by 10% is not a problem for most people. Um, and and they, couldn't get, they couldn't make it go away, but they could convince the FDA uh, to get around that. But they couldn't convince patients and doctors that that was okay, okay? So users uh, and their physicians were wary of the fact that it required a lung function test. Not the same thing as a blood test you can get in any phlebotomy clinic. You would have to go to the lung function lab uh, in the lung physiology lab get a, a test. And this was not a thing that was uh, familiar to most physicians and their patients. Um, so there was widespread, this led to, and or at least didn't get rid of the widespread concern about what the long-term uh, uh, effect on the lungs would be. And that was compared to the competition, which is 80 year history of doing a rotational subcutaneous injection of insulin, which um, is not risk-free, but the risks were really well understood on that. So they had an ineffective technology adoption plan. For those who don't know what an infection, uh, what a technology adoption plan is, um, you are like Pfizer. They also did not know what that was. The biggest problem that they had here was they were changing the technology and imposing a new unit of insulin dosage. You could use the green packet or the blue packet. Nobody knew what the heck that meant. So they said, well, the green packet's one milligram and the blue packet is three milligrams. Still nobody has any idea what that means because it is a nonlinear relationship to international units. That's the one that everybody knows because after all, they're international units. And that's what everyone gets taught is how to use insulin in international units. So you had to have a lookup table to figure out, you would know how much insulin you wanted to deliver in international units. You would go to your lookup table and then you would conveniently get your blue or green packet. Um, that, that was not very effective. Oddly enough, once on the market, diabetologists said that it was hard to use. Why they figured this out after it got to the market, I don't know. Um, and the idea of sort of slapping signs on things that were poorly designed, that came with six pages of simple instructions. Uh, it is not simple and the instructions are not simple if they require six pages. Um, uh, and here, here's an endocrinologist that I can teach somebody how to use an insulin pen in five minutes. It takes nearly an hour to figure out how to teach a patient how to use this properly to treat their diabetes, not just to sort of open it up and um, get the insulin powder to show up in the end. That actually wasn't very difficult. Uh, Pfizer, uh, seeing their, um, their grand idea going down in smoke, literally, uh, in uh, July of 2007, they came out with TV ads saying, now I get it. That's the equivalent of sticking a sign on a poorly designed uh, product. Um, and in fact, it's also the equivalent of trying to explain the uh, punchline of a joke. If you have to explain it, the joke wasn't funny. And basically, if you have to tell people, now I get it, they weren't getting it. Um, here's a very uh, hard one, it, 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 very simple. It's a poor cost justifi uh, benefit justification. Since there wasn't a clear uh, reason how this was going to change uh, and significantly uh, lower the um, uh, the hesitation about starting insulin therapy or improving the compliance with insulin therapy, because that went away, there was no cost uh, justification. And Exubero was going to cost twice as much as injectable. And as we've mentioned, 
we weren't getting rid of injectable, we still had injectable. Uh, and of course, the competition had continued to evolve. Uh, insulin pens uh, were the next, uh, are sort of the next iteration, um, making the uh, diabetics insulin kit even simpler. Um, and then there's insulin pumps, a whole new uh, evolution of subcutaneous injection. Supposedly, this is a picture of the first insulin pump designed in Russia in 1963. Looks like a jet pack, but there you go. Um, and uh, now we have closed loop systems, uh, the first one being approved in 2019. So <clears throat> to wrap up, let's look at this value proposition. In 1994, a, uh, the Exubera product concept is driven forward. We're going to have diabetics uh, who have the problem. They don't like using needles every day. Inhalation is easier, more convenient, no needles, better health. What did we find? Well, they still had to use needles every day. And in fact, that wasn't really the biggest problem for all of the diabetics. Um, turned out that inhalation wasn't easier or more convenient. And uh, it was harder, the technology was harder to figure out the correct dose. And you, in fact, couldn't just use it wherever you wanted because it looked weird. Uh, so there are no needles, better health and quality of life. All of those were falling out as value. And I would argue that diabetics is another problem here. So. Um, in fact, uh, diabetics didn't uh, had problems with this, right? So they were worried about safety. They were worried about convenience. They didn't see a needle-free future, and they didn't find it easy to use from a dosing perspective. Um, the FDA didn't like the safety. They accepted it, but only with uh, reservations. Uh, physicians were concerned also about safety. They were concerned about the benefit. They were concerned about the ease of use. Uh, this turned off a lot of potential influencers that could help. They basically never put in full support. Uh, the payer then is seeing no cost benefit. Uh, and the pharma company who originally was thinking that this is, this is going to be my competitive advantage in the end gives up because the competition uh, is, is beating them. So the uh, take home message from this is you, should put together your value proposition statement, and then you should test your value proposition statement um, because you, it is really just a hypothesis. And without getting out there and asking customers or asking stakeholders, you don't know whether or not it's going to hold up. And your objective is not do not build something that no one wants. And that's what Exuber was, a product that nobody wanted. And that's it. So let me stop sharing my screen here. Oh, thanks, David. Uh, well, we have time for one one question. If anyone has a question for David, based on uh, based on what he just covered. Don't see anything in the chat either. Okay. Well, thank you, David. That was that was very helpful, and I think sets the stage really well for um, our next segment, which is going to be our breakout workshops. Um, so basically, the way this is going to work is there's three different teams, um, and each team, uh, you've all the participants in the workshop have been assigned to a team. So you should know which team you're going to. If you don't, um, Aaron Laroe can help get you in the right room. In the rooms are going to be facilitators who are folks from our department who have um, taken an, on interest and leadership roles in the tele, telehealth process. And um, the goals for each of these workshops is to come up with some solutions um, in each of these areas that can be used and implemented. Um, I sent off um, a template to all of the workshop facilitators to kind of should walk everyone through the process. Um, but basically what you're going to do is we're going to define the problem first. Um, we're going to have some time to think about how that problem affects different stakeholders and think through why it's a problem from different perspectives. And then map out, um, you know, what potential solutions would be that impact those stakeholders and come up with a key um, solution that's implementable as well as a stretch solution that would be, you know, if you had all the resources and all the opportunity, what would you try? Something out of the box, something pretty um, transformative. And you're going to focus then on building out a, um, how you're going to craft your implementable solution 
um, and pitch that to the group after the workshop. And we're going to have um, folks from our telehealth leadership kind of listening to those pitches and provide some feedback. But the goal would be that these ideas can move forward within the department and create some meaningful change, not just for us, but for um, other departments and for Michigan Medicine as a whole. Um, and so what we'll do next in about a minute here is folks are going to get um, trans transitioned into those uh, breakout rooms. Team one is going to look at novel pilot programs in surgical telehealth. So this could be something like um, ways that are cross-disciplinary um, that can be shared with other departments. Um, we'll talk about a few different options. Um, Oliver and I are uh, facilitating that group along with Aaron Leroux. Um, team two is going to look at disparities and access issues in surgical telehealth, both within our network and our state and think about some ways to pilot some programs that could be implemented over the next year. And then team three is gonna look at new technologies. Oh, I'm sorry, team two is being facilitated by Dana Tellum, uh, Teddy Angler, and Tan Wang. Uh, and then team three is uh, implementing new technologies in telehealth, looking at ways to improve things such as remote patient monitoring apps or our, our new MyChart My companion more effectively. And facilitators of that are uh, Chindu, Bill Palazzolo, and Dave Olson. So um, everyone knows what group they're going into, I hope. Uh, you should have all had emails about that. Um, facilitators, I, with that slide deck, if we can kind of get people to um, utilize some of that for their pitches and kind of move, I, I kind of parsed it into how long you should spend on each phase of that development process just as a guideline. Certainly it's gonna have its own organic discussion. Um, I'd encourage each of the facilitators to join in on the brainstorming session and idea session. Um, and then hopefully, um, you know, we'll get some really great presentations from the group. So Aaron, you wanna um, talk about how folks are gonna transition to the breakout rooms? Yep, we have uh, the breakout rooms automatically assigned. So we're gonna hit a button and you guys will all be entered into your breakout room. Message me um, if you want to, uh, choose a different room, um, but we're trying to even them out. So we have a pretty good uh, attendance for each. And then you'll get a little warning, about a minute warning when we're entering back into the regular session after the breakout room is done. Okay, great. So you, you'll all have an hour to kind of work on this. And at the end, um, there'll be a chance to do a five minute pitch. Um, before the pitch, uh, Tom Martin's gonna talk about some uh, regulatory and reimbursement challenges with um, things like uh, remote patient monitoring and, and other, other aspects of telemedicine. Um, that gives you guys a few more extra minutes to put your talks together while, while he's talking too. So, um, and then we'll have the pitches running from um, basically um, 11, uh, 11, I think 11.20 to, or 11.15 to 11.45, uh, and then we'll wrap things up in time for the public webinar, which is gonna start at noon. All right, well, if, with the, if there are no other questions, I will let you all into your breakout rooms and we'll get started. All right, hi everyone, welcome back. The hour goes by really fast, doesn't it? <laughs> like speed dating. It is. So, so I, I knew this was gonna be the case, so that's why uh, I asked Tom Martin to speak next because that gives everybody another 25 minutes to finalize and tweak all of your pitches in a way that uh, um, makes them a little more cohesive. Um, so I'm sure people will be sharing messages and slides back and forth for the next few minutes, but um, I wanted to introduce Tom um, first. Tom is our director of the U of M Coulter program, which is a partnership between engineering and medicine. Um, and he's gonna talk a little bit about, um, in terms of you know, some of the regulatory and reimbursement considerations that have to go into things like remote patient monitoring and devices and, and apps and things like that. So Tom, um, are you, I, I think I saw you on the line there. Yep. I'll turn it over to you and you can screen share and go from there. Great. Can everybody see my screen? So make sure you guys can all hear me. Um, so the long title of the talk, really what I wanna focus on are new technology, really tools to be used in, in telehealth and remote patient monitoring. 
And as Mark mentioned, I come from the product development standpoint. So I'll talk about, you know, remote patient monitoring related reimbursement and regulatory considerations. And really from a new product planning perspective, um, you know, I'm not a clinician, so I really can't address some of the healthcare system type of, of issues and questions that come up. And, and I will say that there's some billing and reimbursement transactional uh, considerations that you guys deal with every day as, as surgeons, clinicians, and, and, and please speak up or, or feel free to, to chime in if I go over something that, that's relevant to what you guys do. And I wanna talk about some case studies to drive home some key takeaways when developing new technologies for remote patient monitoring. And, you know, when Mark, you know, talked about telehealth, I, I said, what, what do I really have to offer here? And, and, and the more I thought about it, I've had you know, direct involvement in multiple projects that are highly related to uh, remote patient monitoring that, that I think really drive home some, some good take home points. So I know I only have until 1115. Um, so I'll talk, talk quickly. And, the old adage of um, when you give a presentation, tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. Let's start out with the, the key takeaways. And the key takeaways here, you know, and I think I'm hitting on elements that have been covered throughout the morning and throughout our breakout session at least. Stay solution focused and solve a problem that both healthcare providers and patients are looking to solve and payers are willing to pay for. I mean, you've got to think about the right patient, the right application, the right market drivers, which are really driving a lot of behaviors we see with the COVID situation in the right time. Um, now, I'm sure we've all, or many of us have seen Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. You know, in developing a new product, make sure you understand demand within a viable business model up front. You know, it's funny talking about reimbursement. You know, we do a lot of work with managed care medical plan directors who really are involved with developing policies. They love products that don't sell, they're really easy to manage. Um, you know, follow the money trail and cash flows. If there's no demand, you're not gonna get any money. Um, you know, technology. So I'll talk a lot about, you know, technology that can be deployed. These are more medical devices and these are tactics, they're not strategy, they're not the end all. So make sure your technology provides the solution you're looking for and understand what that that what the definition of that solution is. And, and cool technology doesn't always sell. I mean, it's gotta work for you. If it's so cumbersome, if elderly patients can't use it, if there's so much in terms of uh, devices that break down, uh, don't work, uh, that's gonna be problematic. Um, so complicated uh, moving parts and fancy math equal high regulatory requirements in most cases. So I'm gonna steal a term from, from Russ King um, he runs a regulatory strategy firm called Method Sense, and they deal a lot with artificial intelligence and machine learning, which has really become the, the, the latest rage over the past couple of years. And, and it boils down to fancy math. And there's some implications to that. It's great technology, great opportunities, but understand what that means in terms of risk, uh, development requirements, and also from a reimbursement standpoint. Uh, what does that mean in terms of employing this in healthcare? And make sure that your uh, you know, product strategy and regulatory strategy are aligned and to really make sure you understand your development pathway. If something's not on label, it's deemed experimental and you're not gonna get coverage. Talk a little bit about the Apple Watch uh, EKG app um, and what the actual indication is. Uh, so indicate the intended use defines the risk and defines how FDA is gonna look at this technology. You have an interpretive diagnostic using artificial intelligence and it provides a predictive score that leads to a, a medical intervention or change in care plan. It's very likely gonna be a class three PMA, pre-market approval requirement. I'll talk about that in a few minutes, what the implications are. It means it's gonna cost a lot more money, much higher risk. Wearable monitor wellness tool could be class two or could be unrelated. Um, so the, uh, um, what I wanna do is go through some, some case studies now to kind of drive home the, these, these points. And uh, you know, feel free to interrupt me if there's any, any specific questions or comments. Uh, and you know, thinking through the most complicated scenario I can come up with, 
you know, if we look at a problem of 30 day readmission rates with heart failure patients, you know, what are some of the solutions out there related to heart to, to remote patient monitoring? And if you look at what Boston Scientific's doing, you look at all the bigs are doing in this space. You've got Medtronic, Abbott, you know, they have these implantable um, you know, heart monitors, you know, CRTD devices, ICD devices, and they now have technology to interrogate these remotely. And they actually have the ability to combine multiple sources of information with multiple sensors to come up with an algorithmic composite index score to provide an alert of potential worsening of heart failure. And think of the value of that in monitoring patients. And it, it utilizes a pretty simple to use device and they developed called the Latitude NXT that deploys this, this algorithmic approach and they actually have wireless scales and blood pressure cuffs that can link into this device. And it's, it's one that looks like it's providing a tremendous advantage. I don't know if it's used here or not, um, but it's a company looking to provide a solution and it's very much related to their specific technology. And, and there's a business reason for that, but there's also a regulatory reason for that. Um, to get this approved by FDA, they had to go through an FDA pre-market approval. And really this is a, a pre-market approval also known as PMA. Um, you talk to most medical device companies, they'll tell you PMA is a four letter word uh, because it costs so much money. And if you look at the cost of bringing a PMA device to market, um, there was a study done in 2010, uh, you know, my and it, 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 um, you know, it looks like the, the cost is roughly $75 million just with the regulatory cost, about $95 million to bring it all the way through to full approval from concept to approval. So these are, these are big ticket items, but one that, you know, a Boston scientific can effectively manage and they're good at that and it fits with their strategy. And, and I, it could be a fit for, for Michigan medicine. And I think that's where the notion of identifying a, a, a problem up front and then looking to see what solutions are already out there that could be deployed. Um, so it's just not advancing here. Um, and looking at a system like this, and again, I use this as a, as a case study, as an example, uh, there's a lot of work over the past year with ensuring coverage and coding for remote interrogation of devices and for telemedicine, telehealth. And, and we look at the, 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 the key elements of getting paid for this. There's coverage, coding, and payment in terms of coverage is coverage policies. First, you need to have a code. And so there's new, these G codes are temporary codes that were just instituted this year, but they're you know, once per 30 day reads. So there is coding and coverage available um, for this, this activity. So moving on to another example, uh, we all know that compliance is a big issue for patients taking their medication. And there's, for years, this has been an issue. There's been MEMS caps, many different means of trying to improve compliance with patients. I mean, pills don't work if they stay in the bottle. So if we look at some different technologies out there, uh, there's some really novel technology. And I was actually involved in this before it even got to Proteus. So a company named Proteus developed this smart pill concept they got the IP or intellectual property from Dow Chemical, believe it or not. And, and I was involved in an in, in innovation uh, project with Dow Chemical back in 2008. They, they actually came up with a concept where they took these capsules and were able to purchase off the shelf RFID chips that they could implant in one side of the capsule. The other side, they would put active pharmaceutical ingredient in and this capsule, they close it and it prevents the RFID chip from transmitting a signal. Patients can wear a wristwatch, uh, which is a receiver. The RFID chip transmits. So when a patient takes a pill, they swallow it, goes in their stomach, capsule breaks open, records the, the pill number, the date, and the time the pill was taken. Great concept, right? Great technology. So uh, when we looked at it in 2008, you know, God, Dow wanted to find out where this could be deployed. So it was a technology looking for a solution. And so the first, my first thought was go to, uh, you know, the, the, the contract um, research organizations, groups like Quintiles, PPD, because when you do a clinical trial, how do you control for compliance? 
Um, interestingly, they weren't interested. Their biggest issue at the time was converting from paper case report forms to electronic uh, case report forms. Talk to pharma companies, they weren't interested. So our notion was that the technology was ahead of its time. So Proteus licensed this, and, and, and Dow abandoned the, the IP on this, and their lawyers said they don't want anything going inside the body. The Dow Corning situation, it kind of got burned. So oh, Atsuka picked this up. Uh, so Proteus picked this up, developed it, and licensed it to Atsuka, who developed it for a uh, uh, antidepressant drug for schizophrenia, uh, bipolar disorder, and, and severe depression. Same concept, patient takes a pill, they were an external patch, they've got a mobile device that can transmit to a central location, so you can monitor compliance. Uh, great concept. Um, and this was a startup company, FDA approved this in 2017. This is a, an image of a unicorn uh, behind this. Some of you guys follow the startup world and venture capital world. Any company that's valued over a billion dollars considered a unicorn. Um, great concept, right? Great improvement. Where do you go from here with a situation like this? Well, what happened in 2019? They were in financial distress. Similar story to David Olson's story, um, you know, in terms of there you know, were some challenges that happened. Just a couple of weeks ago, they filed bankruptcy. And so this company actually raised over $500 million, and, but they struggled to sell it to physicians insurance. And I think the key take home here is to really understand what went wrong and make sure that we're solving a problem. And again, that technology is a, a solution, but not the end all. You know, so the Billify My Site, which was the drug they developed that incorporated this technology was double the cost of generic Abilify. Um, and it didn't really meet the patient experience. I think what we heard a lot today is you've got to fit the patient needs and the patient experience. Is this what the patients really want? Will they comply? Um, you've got a, a technology for a patient population that has a paranoia about being followed. So our solution is to track them. Um, not a good fit. And so it's an obvious learning. Uh, and the company has since they, they pivoted and they're going to look at applying this towards oncology and, and, and uh, you know, in, in infectious diseases, tuberculosis, other applications. We'll see where they go. I want to give another example. Um, Watch pad for home sleep studies. So for obstructive sleep apnea, this is a wearable device for doing home sleep studies. Why is this important? Well, what's the alternative now in lab sleep studies? I mean, think about the prospect of being diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea, coming into a center, a strange place where you're instrumented up six ways till Sunday, and you've got someone in a back room watching you all night long. Pretty, pretty inhibiting. Um, versus doing this in a home setting with a very easy to use device that incorporates it. It's got a, it, it's a patch that goes over the sternum for cardiac monitoring that links to this. This is all it is, a wristwatch, a device you put on your finger. It connects to an app, pretty simple to use. You click a, you click a few buttons and you're done. And it's 89% correlated with an in-lab PSG. So if we look at cost, you know, we're developing a device within the Coulter program for obstructive sleep apnea, you're looking to do a clinical study. And six, our cost uh, within the university is $1,600 per night for a sleep study versus $90 for a watch pad sleep study. Uh, and if you look at, you know, the value of this, already it's been endorsed by, you know, one of the leading medical societies in this case, American Academy of Sleep Medicine. And if we look from a, from an insurance standpoint, Blue Care Network, uh, we've interviewed four managed care medical plan directors, and they said they all encourage home sleep studies at this point because they're saving money, and patients love it. It makes it easier. So again, a good good success story. Um, so we talked about one compliance tool that really didn't work. Let's talk about one that does work for CPAPs for sleep apnea. You know, continuing positive airway pressure machines. They have in these built-in compliance monitors as a chip that can determine when the device is being used. And it really confirms how long it's being used every night. So there's, I would say adherence if you stop altogether and compliance, how often, how long do you use this device over time period, uh, pre predefined time period. Why is that important? Well, Medicare uses that right now. They use that to determine whether or not you're gonna get reimbursed. So these devices are distributed through durable medical equipment suppliers. 
And there's different models that can be used. You can buy it outright. There can be straight leases, uh, rent to own. But Medicare wants to make sure that you're using this at least four hours per night or 70% of the nights. And this came from our own you know, U, U of M uh, website. And so it's been a tremendous success in tracking compliance and also incentivizing patients, frankly, to continue using these devices. And also it's a means of providing remote monitoring to uh, determine improvement in patient sleep apnea with apnea hypopnea index, uh, desaturation index, other metrics that are commonly used in, in tracking these patients. Um, I know I'm talking fast, so I wanna get through this. Uh, I'll offer a few minutes for question and answers. So the Apple Watch, I'm sure a lot of us have an Apple Watch. Um, it has the built-in uh, EKG app. What is this? Is it a medical device or is it a consumer product? What does the FDA say about this? Well, they came out in 2012 and they said, you know what, there's so many wearable monitors out there. We can't manage them all. We can't regulate them all. You want to monitor someone's heart rate, that's fine and dandy. Um, we're not going to regulate that. Someone's pulse, we're not going to regulate that. If you do single aid EKG and you're going to start making decisions or defining when people need to seek health care, we're going to step in and manage that. So what did they do in this case? And if we look at the actual approval level, this had to go through the FDA as a class two device under what's called the de novo process. And if you look at the indication, um, and it, it really, it's categorized as, um, generic name is, is, is um, electrocardiograph software for over-the-counter use. For, it's for informational use only. It's not intended for diagnosis and not recommended for users with other known arrhythmias. So what's it for? Um, it, it's, I, I'm not sure. It's a cool thing to have on your wrist, but it's one that is um, very, very well defined in terms of it's, it's really not intended specifically for medical use. Maybe captured in my chart, I'm not sure. And I'm sure you guys know a lot more about how it's being used, but these are things that the FDA is looking at in terms of how it's gonna be used and restrictions in terms of how they interpret the way these things should be used. Um, Last but not least, um, I, want, I want to quickly talk about something that's actually low tech or no tech from a remote patient monitoring standpoint. I used to work for Bayer Bio Biological Products back in the early 2000s, and we did a, a biologic replacement therapy for alpha-1 and trypsin deficiency. And we had an enzyme replacement therapy. We had alpha-1 and trypsin. We, we sold and we could not supply the market. It's a plasma-derived therapeutic and we could supply about 2,600 patients across the US. And there were patients at times where we couldn't give them their full dose. And so really where crisis you know, breeds innovation, you know, a guy named John Walsh created the Alpha One Foundation and the AlphaNet group called AlphaNet. They had a scenario where they had people with the condition serve as coordinators to coordinate with other Alpha One patients. And it was the most impactful program I've ever seen from a disease management standpoint where people with a condition called other people, and they actually had this, this reference guide, this wellness program, they called the Big Fat Reference Guide. And they could tell if people were starting to crash or have problems to get in to see their doctor, highly influential to get up an exercise, diet. And from a company standpoint with Bayer, we had orphan status, which gave us exclusivity. And we were tied to the hip with AlphaNet and coordinating with them making sure they knew where we stood with our supply. And we worked so closely with patients that when other companies entered the market um, after our orphan, uh, orphan uh, situation ended, you know, we retained 85% market share. And it was a tremendously valuable uh, program. And again, it was, it was low tech, but highly effective as a solution. So, so that's it from, and I, I think I'm, a little before 11.15, so apologize for talking uh, so fast. Uh, anybody have any comments or questions? Glad to, uh, glad to answer. This is great, Tom. Uh, any questions from anyone in the, in the uh, room? You can either put it in the chat or I can call on you.
Tom, do you think there's some things we can do better as, as a health system to kind of um, implement these technologies more effectively in terms of like, um, you know, one of the challenges is always um, how to know who to partner with and for the right technology for the right types of patients and, and making sure that we can use these technologies to get data, but also to capture some billing reimbursement in a meaningful way. So. Do you, do you think that the process we have, you know, what, what can we do in that process that would make it better? Well, I think, again, as I said earlier, is start with the end in mind in terms of what your solution needs to look like and then find the right technology. Um, I, I look at this, this um, watch pad, for example, it, it's currently being used by the, the sleep clinic here at U of M for studies and it's increasing use. It doesn't obviate the need for an in-lab sleep study but it is currently being used. It's being used in clinical studies. Um, so it's been a great opportunity for, for that group. Um, I, I think that there's opportunities to partner with payers and have shared goals across you know, multiple constituents in terms of not only the patients in the healthcare system, you know, Michigan Medicine, but also Blue Care Network, who you know, we all wanna manage patients better. Um, so I think there, there could be, I know the question comes up, I know there's, there's been questions on inducement, um, question about giving patients technology. Uh, these are all solvable hurdles, surmountable hurdles, but you've got to get all the constituents together and focus on really defining what that solution looks like and then defining what the best fit is with the technology. Any other questions for Tom? This is Tom Wakefield. Can I ask one question? And that is, um, I understand about the fact of always trying to understand, um, you know, uh, the group that you're trying to aim something for. And in fact, do they want it? Do they need it? But sometimes technology uh, that if you ask at one time, you need it is different than if you ask at another time. So just for example, with Zoom, I mean, if you ask most people in January, if they needed something like Zoom, I bet you most people would say no. But now if you ask them after the pandemic, everybody would say, we need a better Zoom, yes. So how do you sometimes uh, make the decision uh, if the technology that you have just has to be shown at a different time or in a different way versus asking people if they need it before you make a decision to go ahead? Yeah. So this is, is very akin to new product planning and development, where the first thing is to really understand your customer. First, define who is your customer and really understand and define that population because it's not going to be for everybody. So as you specify and define that potential patient population, customer, your physician specialty, then understand what are the current habits and practices? What are they doing now? And what are the challenges? Uh, you know, you term FUD factor, fear, uncertainty, doubt, what are they facing? And then it helps determine or define what the solution needs to look like, right? The technology is, is just a tactic. So we knew from a Zoom call that we use blue jeans at U of M and it broke down all the time. Um, I hate to say it, it's pretty simple. It broke down. I mean, you got a lot of people on a call, it didn't work. Um, so it was for that reason that we switched to Zoom. So we start out, what are the problems? Well, I use blue jeans and people either can't connect, they can't download, or when they're on, it's sporadic. So right there, you start defining what the needs are. And then Zoom came in, it hit fit the need. Um, so I think that's a, a big part of it. I'll give you another example with sleep apnea, that we're developing a device. It's a nasopharyngeal airway access device. I know Mark knows about these on the Coulter Oversight Committee. Uh, it's, a, it's a means of sticking, sticking this tube into your nose and your nasopharyngeal airway, and it obviates the need for a CPAP device, which is cumbersome, people don't like it. And the first question we got is, nobody's gonna wanna stick something up their nose, especially when they see all the COVID tests going on. Well, this is not a COVID test, which is designed to scrape the nasopharyngeal surface to make sure you get enough sample that you can test. This is designed to do the opposite. And so we learned that if we don't demonstrate tolerability, right, nobody's gonna use it. We talked to four managed care, medical, managed care plan medical directors and they said, I'm not worried about this because no one's gonna use it. He said, you gotta show 
you're, you're not inferior to CPAP, price comparable to CPAP, and you can demonstrate tolerability. I talked to Phillips, who do leaders in the CPAP space. They said, yeah, if you can show you get more than four hours a night, we're really interested. Um, for more than three months, we're interested. Boom, they just gave us our, our, our marching orders of what we need to do in developing a device. None of that answers your question. So again, I come from the product planning standpoint. I think you can employ these techniques in, in, in telemedicine. Okay. Any other last questions for Tom? All right. So um, the next, thanks, Tom. I really appreciate that overview. I thought that was very, very helpful and, and kind of adds another dimension to how we think about these, these type of technologies as we move, move into new opportunities with telehealth. Um, so the next phase of the, of the workshop and the last phase of the workshop here is, um, you know, now that you all have had uh, time to work through some of these ideas a little bit, um, we're just going to have a real brief pitch of what you guys talked about in each of the breakouts in terms of um, what, what's, the what's the problem, what's the solution, what's the kind of value proposition in terms of what you would think about doing to solve that problem and how you're going to think about potentially getting it implemented. Um, I know an hour is not a lot of time to do this, and certainly we don't expect um, fully flushed ideas at this point. This is more to get the get the brain processes working, get people excited about these new opportunities. And the goal is really going to be the LDP is a starting point. So this is an opportunity for this these ideas to move forward, people to meet again, to talk about these, to develop them further, and then um, with the goal of implementing them and having a chance to make some change and, and seeing this impact, not only for the department, but for Michigan Medicine and for our patients. So I, the goal is these, these ideas are all gonna move forward and, and um, this is just a starting point, but I'm excited to hear what everyone's talked about and come up with. And so um, without further ado, I think group one is gonna go first. We'll just go in order. The way this will work is we have, we'll have five minutes to kind of pitch your idea. You don't have to use all five minutes, but you'll have five minutes. Um, and we'll have some feedback from um, Jesse DeVito and Chad Elamudel. Um, Jesse and Chad, you wanna introduce yourselves real quick? Yeah, sure, Mark. I'm a urologist here at Michigan Medicine. I'm the tobacco director for I think your microphone cut out a little bit, Chad, but um, no, welcome. Thanks for being here. Jesse, are you still here? She might have had to pop off the call for a minute. Okay. So team one, I think Mike Kemp is presenting. Yep, one second, I'll share my screen. Here, sorry. All right. Can you see my screen? <clears throat> yep. All right. Perfect. All right. So um, we were tasked with coming up with an idea regarding piloting um, a new program for telemedicine. And one of the things that we discussed in our group was the problem related to uh, patients being evaluated in the ED um, and sort of that process uh, in terms of, you know, is there an opportunity for us to streamline it using telemedicine uh, in order to get them to uh, a surgeon and ultimately their operation. So first we defined our problem uh, and we discussed that there uh, was a delay between being evaluated in the emergency department um, and being seen by a surgeon and getting their, uh, their operation for really non-emergent surgical diagnoses. And specifically, this results in a number of problems for uh, various uh, folks. Uh, most importantly, the patient. Uh, this can create a level of anxiety and uh, issues related to delays in their care. And if the delays occur for long enough, they can end up having repetitive emergency room visits, um, uh, which cer certainly can have its own level of of financial and, and sort of anxiety cost distresses for the folk, for the person. 
Um, there's issues related to the surgeon as the delays uh, continue that can result in worsening disease. Um, they can actually make the operation more difficult. And then also with the uh, emergency department, uh, if these patients have to keep coming back, it can result in capacity issues uh, as well as uh, uh, utilization of resources um, that can be you know, better used elsewhere. So what we thought about doing was trying to streamline this process from the time that the patients are evaluated and diagnosed in the emergency department um, and try to get them to their, uh, their surgeon. We thought primarily that a target group for this pilot uh, uh, group would be really non-emergent diagnoses. And, and specifically, we decided to you know, focus on trying to pilot this with uh, gallbladder disease and uh, things like biliary colic with the goal that the patient would try to see the, would, would be con, uh, contacted by the surgeon and seen by the surgeon in a video visit within 24 to 48 hours uh, in the hopes that this would also streamline them getting their operation faster. So our value proposition uh, is that creating a better process for patients seeing the ED would have a, with a recent workup and the need to see a surgeon would allow for a quicker follow-up, more efficient uh, process, less cost to the system, and ultimately improve care for both patients as well as uh, you know, Michigan medicine providers. So there's a lot of stakeholders uh, that are going to be important to make this work. Uh, and you know, we identified six uh, different stakeholders. In order to make sure this is a sustainable process and efficient, um, we need to talk with our surgeons to make sure that we set the standards for what really can be effectively done in a video visit and to identify any diagnoses that um, this could or could not apply to. We don't wanna to talk to our patients to make sure that we're actually improving access to them and then uh, look at uh, sort of what the time to surgeon is as well as uh, how this affects um, uh, their anxiety during the process. Uh, we wanna to talk to the ED, make sure that we make the workflow easy and don't create uh, documentation barriers uh, to referrals. Um, and then also try to use the fact that the patient's in the ED as sort of a potential starting point uh, to create, you know, more of like an asynchronous start to their telehealth visit where they can start to answer some of the questions uh, uh, that will be um, related to that visit. We want to talk to the call center, um, essentially uh, make it a, a, a one-stop opportunity for patients to get scheduled try to think about uh, adding in chat functions that are, you know, 24 seven availability, and then also try to integrate self scheduling options, keeping in, in mind that really there's going to be different subset of patients that, you know, various options are going to be ideal for, um, but that, you know, a one Avenue is not going to be the best option for everybody. And then uh, talk uh, with the office of patient experience to uh, work with helping the, um, uh, create a better design and, and sort of optimize the patient experience while they're, go while they're going through this process. And then finally, the virtual care team to sort of make sure that we integrate uh, my chart and get, uh, can get data that can improve further outcome, uh, uh, for further uh, uh, improvements in our process. So our implementation plan is we identified that, you know, gallbladder disease is a, a great adopter for this initial pilot. Uh, plan is to discuss with the various stakeholders the things that you know I just mentioned, um, and how to make this you know process really efficient and easy for both patients and providers. Um, we plan to try to implement this process over six months with plans to uh, uh, get follow-up metrics, um, and really those metrics are going to be: Does this uh, streamline the process? Does it make the time from the ED to a visit shorter, and then ultimately uh, the time to surgery? Um, is this going to have a beneficial effect on the patient experience? And then does this also have a reduction, a uh, uh, efficiency and resource utilization um, uh, benefit by reducing the number of repeat ED visits uh, and ultimately uh, unnecessary utilization of resources? Um, and then after implementation, improving efficacy, uh, the next thing would be to see if there are other diagnoses that this would that this would be suitable for. So going back to the surgeons, uh, and patients and, and seeing if there's other non-emergent diagnoses that we can translate this, this pilot into.
All right, thank you, Mike. Um, so just to allow everybody a chance to present, we'll have all three presentations and then we'll do the Q&A at the end, okay? So team two, are you ready? Yes, that is me. Um, I am going to present on the behalf of my team. And so I just want to um, remind everyone that our, we were tasked with um, coming up with pilot program to improve disparities around uh, telemedicine. So let me share my screen. And so, Okay, so um, what the, the problem that we identified was that efforts to expand telemedicine may worsen disparities in medicine if we're not intentional about addressing these issues. And the problem can really be in a number of different ways. So there's evidence that um, older patients may struggle with technology. Um, racial minorities have less access to internet or computers within the home. And when you compound all of these issues, um, there might be like fundamental issue of like mistrust with using telemedicine. And so um, what we sort of discuss as a group is that we really don't know where the problem is. Like is the problem that um, people won't be able to use telemedicine because they don't have access to internet? Is it because they don't have computers in the home? Is it because um, they don't have the time to be able to do something like that? Or is there like a lack of um, understanding of how to use my chart for a video visit and or is the fact that they the um, there's going to be a lack of telemedicine because patients really crave that inpatient in-person visit and um, worry about getting substandard care if it's all done um, via telemedicine and so um, when we were really brainstorming the solution what we realized is that we don't know enough about the problem to come up with an adequate solution um, if we jump straight to the solution without understanding this that the chances are high that we're going to come up with a problem that we don't um, with a, a solution that doesn't actually address the root problem and so our pilot solution is actually that we need more data and so we proposed a rigorous study in order to figure out exactly what the barriers to telemedicine would be. And so we um, want to do a sequential explanatory mixed methods study. And so what this would be is first a quantitative analysis of current telemedicine usage at Michigan Medicine and with a special eye on the current disparities. And so we're going to look at things like age. Are we excluding older patients with telemedicine? We'll look at race. Are we excluding um, minority patients, um, you know, gender, whether or not maybe there's any differences in terms of whether men or women use telemedicine. And also with the state of Michigan, um, we would really need to look additionally at um, geographic locations. So there's um, evidence that um, people in rural areas don't have as good access to internet. Um, and so that could be a major barrier. And, um, and so then based on that, we'll do a qualitative analysis in which we will talk to representative um, patients in these um, in, the, in these uh, demographics of patients who are underutilizing telemedicine and really to understand what is what are their barriers. And so the value proposition of really this is that um, we feel like the Michigan, the mission of uh, Michigan medicine um, includes a responsibility to serve its community, um, but beyond that this is also an opportunity to improve our operational efficiency or capacity and so if we're able to see more um, telemedicine visits then perhaps this will allow um, providers to see more patients during their clinic period and then it's also an opportunity for health system expansion um, i think that as we're seeing beaumont henry ford um, you know, all of these like huge systems, allegiance, for instance, expand, um, we're realizing that we are potentially missing out on some opportunities. Um, there's a lot of patients, um, we really just don't have a very diverse patient base. Um, and even though Detroit is just 30 minutes down the road, a lot of those patients aren't interested in coming to us for um, their care. And so I think this is a great opportunity to improve that. And so, I didn't get to making the slide about our stretch pilot because I ran out of time, but um, I, I think our stretch pilot that we've really envisioned is a um, chance to engage the community in this. And so we sort of, um, you know, uh, pictured a situation in which 
um, there's a community center or a public library or something um, in Detroit where we could have our um, patients go to there to do telemedicine. And so um, one way that we could really engage the community is, for instance, utilizing the Doctors of Tomorrow program. And so these are young people who are very committed to improving healthcare um, in underserved communities. They're really engaged in this. And then on Saturdays, I'm sure they would love to man a telemedicine booth if there's a Michigan provider on the other end of it who can help talk about problems. Um, and so that would help um, with some of the issues with trust because these are trusted members of the community that we're going to be leveraging. So like churches, for instance, um, it could help with some of the issues um, around like actual help um, digital literacy because we'd have our young teenagers helping out with setting up the Zoom meetings and things like that. Um, it helps out with some of the issues that we're um, around like things like how do you get vitals during a telemedicine visit if we have scales and all of the stuff available and someone who could take vital basic vitals um, and so i think that that's an opportunity to um, really expand oh i'll stop sharing my screen now all right and then that's that's really awesome i, I think uh there's a lot of opportunity there to to think through some ways to to really address some of those gaps and and understand the data a little better um the last group group three who's who wants to present for you guys i'll be presenting for team three i love how the residents are presenting for all three teams that's great <laughs> Do you see the screen? Yes. What do you see? Um, we just see your slides. It's not in your slides. No. Okay. Um, so our team was tasked with, um, or the topic of implementing new technologies. Um, in telehealth. And so the problems that we ended up talking about and focusing on are the technological barriers um, of releasing new technology. So patients have impaired access to telehealth with um, central issues in um, technology literacy, access to technology, cost, and the usability of it. Um, we particularly had in mind um, the elderly population who may not necessarily have a smartphone at home or webcams or um, just not be familiar with the use of technology in general, not as um, te technologically literate as maybe um, younger patients might be. Our um, proposal is to, um, it, it's actually multifold, um, but we would start off by creating a best practices collaboration across um, the many departments in Michigan Medicine to understand all the stakeholder holders, so the patient, the payer, the hospital needs, and create a master list of existing technologies that we already have through our MyChart and other technologies that the hospital already um, pays for and uses in everyday care. Um, and then um, focus on, and then come up with a list of things that could supplement those things, um, areas of gap that fill um, specific needs for patients. So um, each department or each um, section or group may have a separate uh, patient need that they would like to focus on. If that, um, say, you know, um, they want to focus on like collecting colostomy output, that could be one of their focuses. And then depending on what that specific um, health problem is, um, the technology needs may be different. Um, so based on this, we'd create a telehealth starter kit um, and then launch that as a pilot program and use of that as a pilot program. Um, is this the, I think this is the value proposition slide. <laughs> um, so the value proposition of uh, having a starter kit would be that um, it could help uh, solve the problem of um, patient technology literacy, access to technology, and the cost of it. Um, and we can, sorry, this is kind of a similar slide, but anyway, um, these are the um, stakeholders and um, the value propositions for each of them. So for the patient, and they'll receive existing technology that addresses um, what they feel is, is their most significant healthcare problem. 
Um, and for the pair, it'll, it would cost um, a bit to have some sort of uh, starter kit, but in the long term, it would decrease costs because um, we'd be taking better care of our patients and they'd have better outcomes and decreased um, readmission rates. Um, from the hospital perspective, we'll be able to provide more active, uh, rapid access to patients. Um, and um, we won't lose out to other com competing healthcare systems in the area um, by being able to provide more timely care for our patients. And for the providers, um, we'll be able to, it creates an opportunity for um, transitioning from episodic to more continuous care, and it'll enhance the um, real care relationship with patients. Um, hospital staff, we talked about um, this, the ex using existing technology might decrease the learning curve and um, it would simplify data entry and tracking of patient health um, data points. Um, this is our timeline for what we envision um, of our pilot. Uh, we think that it might take 12 to 18 months in order um, to go from collecting all the data and figuring out what areas to focus on, um, collecting information on what existing technologies we have and where the gaps are, finding um, the, the technology to fill the gap, and then um, launching it into a, a pilot program that we can actually test with a group of patients. Uh, we think that the deliverables from this would be um, actual patient data, whether um, we were able to collect the right amount of data as planned, um, whether we retain patients over time and um, patient outcomes and other quality metrics um, tracked in um, different areas. So um, in summary, our pitch is for a customized starter kit. This would be based on the patient's needs, um, provider needs, um, and we'll keep in mind the, um, the different uh, factors uh, presented by the payer and the healthcare system. And um, it would provide an easy to use platform for all patients, even patients who don't necessarily have access to technology and um, make uh, telehealth easier for everyone. I'll stop sharing. I hope I did justice to our presentation. No, that, that was great. Um, so, you know, three great, three great ideas. Um, so I'll start, we'll start a little bit of uh, feedback and Q&A for the teams. Chad, do you want to start it off? Yeah, sure. Uh, I switched microphones, so hopefully this is a little bit easier to hear me. Um, well, first of all, I think, yeah, all three of these ideas and the areas are very high impact. Um, I think congratulations to the teams that put these together in such a short amount of time. Uh, these are things that the health system, our, our department, the entire health system is thinking about as we transition away from the, you know, the kind of the emergency state of COVID to a more optimal delivery of virtual care. Um, so in interest of time, I'll just kind of go through each project and I'll just give you some feedback on some of the things that we've seen because we've, we've seen sort of similar uh, parallel processes that we're trying to, that we try to do in our department too. So we may get some lessons learned from that. So the first was about um, evaluating uh, patients in the emergency room in, in a quicker way uh, so that they can have a faster pathway to surgery. And I think this is huge. Uh, this is a really big area, very high impact area. And uh, the cool thing about uh, this particular pilot is it's actually scalable to a lot of other departments too. Like we have the same issue with kidney stones. Patients are in pain with kidney stones. They need to get to surgery quickly. They're seen in the emergency room waiting three weeks for an appointment before they get their surgery um, seems a little unnecessary. So um, I guess one of the first questions I'd want to ask the team is, uh, you know, why doesn't this happen now? Um, that, that's kind of the first thing. Why, why, why can't we do faster time to surgery, faster evaluations now, um, and even using existing technologies like, uh, like telephone. And then the fact that in specific for general, for the surgery department, you know, the fact that, you know, surgery has kind of been in the forefront of virtual care. Like, why do you think that that wasn't happening now? Um, so that, I think that's kind of an important thing to sort of understand what the, like the real world barriers are once you uh, once you start to implement it, uh, in, once you start to implement it, and I think some of the challenges from an operational standpoint that you'll run into is that that time frame is short for. I mean, it's an ideal time frame, but it's also kind of short for everyone that's involved. It's, in, it's short for patients um, to get the technology set up using existing processes. So this is going to involve redesigning some of the care. So it's short for patients to get set up, 
um, it's short to have pay providers available to do the consultations, clinic slots available, um, if, if, if we're relying on the standard uh, you know, clinic grid. So maybe it involves uh, a clinical response team, an APP re response team that can kind of view these, view, look at the, do these consultations quicker. Um, and then, so those are kind of the things that you can think about from a patient side, from a provider standpoint. Um, and then the one other thing was that from your, along those lines, one thing that's going to be essential in your stakeholder group is actually to in include those people that may be involved in that, like uh, clinical care coordinators, RNs, uh, medical assistants, and it may, you can include them for their perspective, but then you should also include their leadership too, because a lot of what happens as you're trying to scale workflows for someone who you're not their boss, then what ends up happening is you run into leadership barriers too. So engaging them very early in the process is going to be so extremely important for it to be successful, but I think it's very high impact. Well, that, that's great, Chad. I think um, since we're a little bit limited on time, what we're going to do is we're going to take all of these kind of suggestions and points. And um, I think all of the teams are going to plan to move this process along and, and continue this development process. And so um, we may, you know, reach back out to you to get some feedback as, as we're kind of answering some of those important questions and developing that. But you, you raise a lot of key points um, that they're certainly going to be need to be addressed if this is going to be a 